Golden Age Radio is starting now. Subscribe to get future updates. Get ready for some spy thrillers and noir detective mysteries with The Man Called X, Secret Agent K7, Dangerous Assignments, Richard Diamond, Dick Tracy, The Avengers, Whistler, Shadow, Falcon, and Top Secret. You're twice as sure with two great names, Frigidaire and General Motors. Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there's mystery, intrigue, romance, and all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as Ken Thurston, the man called X. To most people, mention of the bolero and the samba mean pleasant, colorful music. But to the man called X, listen. The samba, Chief, I thought that was the name of a dance. Oh, this is serious, Ken. The samba docked here in New York Harbor early this morning. But her companion ship, the bolero, has mysteriously disappeared. Oh? In spite of the fact they had ideal sailing conditions all the way from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Where's the Coast Guard? Well, their planes have scoured every inch of the route and found nothing. Chief, what's our interest in this? Well, in the first place, Dick Finley's an old friend of mine. Oh, I know Dick. Insurance. Right. And the Bolero's cargo was insured by him for a flat 500,000 bucks. <whistles> Finley evidently smelled a rat, a big one. That's why he called me. But if he smelled a rat, why did he give such big coverage without complete investigation? Well, because John Messler, owner of the Bolero, used to be one of his biggest clients. Messler Plantation? Yeah. The fact remains, the one man who can give us the dope on this thing is Dick Finley. Well, he's at work on it already. Been talking with Carl Hertzberg. He's Messler's manager and the rest of the crew of the Samba down at Pier 14. Uh, I've sent Ryan over to pick him up so you yourself can talk to him. Sorry, uh, Chief. Hello, Ryan. Yes, Ryan. Somebody else got to Finley first. What? He's down at the morgue with a forty-five slug through his back. Zelschmidt Enterprises, Pagan Zelschmidt General Manager on Duty. Hey, go on. What under the sun is that supposed to mean? Oh, hello, Mr. X. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that I am now in business for myself. I'm overjoyed. What business? I'm glad you asked that. I can't quite decide whether to limit myself to detective work or go in for financial consulting. Why not just settle on organized chicanery? Well, that's a very good suggestion, and I... Huh? Don't even know what the meaning of the word. Well, maybe it'll come to you. Now, listen, I got a job for you down at the docks. For me? Um, you mean you, you've you come to me? This has to be handled with discretion, Pagan. Oh, Mr. Thurston, I shall regard your confidence as a sacred trust, especially for cash. Same one? Si, senor. He's just not turning into this alley. Good. It's very dark along here. This will do very well. Are you quick? Here, quick. Step into this doorway. I'll walk on a little and stop to light a cigarette. That will let him catch up and we'll have him between us. Hurry now. Si, senor. One moment, my curious friend. Uh, who are you? I don't know you. Then we should become better acquainted, since you've been spying on me for two days. Oh, no, no. I've I, I never seen you before. There must be some... 
Who's this? A friend of mine. Oh, well, I, I'd better be going now. I don't think so. The gun? Quiet. Who are you? Well, my name, my name is Zellschmidt. Egon Zellschmidt. Zellschmidt. It always helps to know who you're dealing with in such matters as this. Well, well, I'd be going now. I... Mr. Zellschmidt, huh? have you ever noticed what a final sound the slide of an automatic pistol makes? Wait! No, 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 no! Come, senor, we get away fast now. Muy pronto. Wait, just to make sure. Mr. X. Now, Pago, why can't you wait till the morning? But, Mr. Thurston, something terrible has happened. What? I've been shot. I'm dead. I see. I see. Where are you calling from? New Jersey. Oh, it must be serious. Now that you've had your fun, Pago, hang up and let me go back to sleep. Wait, you don't understand? I, I'm as good as dead right this minute. And it's all your fault. My fault? I haven't shot anybody, at least not tonight. But somebody did. And now my poor cousin Egan lies dead. Egan? He was one of my strictly list of cousins, you understand. Egan, what in heaven's name are you talking about? But, but I've just told you it's, it's that job you wanted me to do. What? Well, I, I couldn't quite find the time to do it myself. You know, circumstances beyond my control, of course. So, so you put your cousin Egan in it, eh? Go on. Well, a little while ago, the police found his body. And now I... Where did they find it? Anywhere close to Pier 14? Where else? Mr. X, you've got to do something. There's only one thing to do. Well, yes, Mr. Thurston? I want you to take a plane immediately. Plane? And I'll meet you one week from today in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Senor, you are Americano and you wish a room, no? Matter of fact, yes. My name's Thurston. Ken Mr. Thurston. Mr. Thurston, welcome to the Grand Palace Hotel of San Juan. Here, I have it all figured out. What? It comes to exactly $164.20. What are you talking about? That, of course, does not include the two bottles of aguardiente which were sent up to the room last night. They amount to... Now, look that... here. I just arrived from the States and I'd like a room. Oh, you already have a room. The governor suite. Huh? Uh, your manager, Mr. Thurston. He has taken care of everything. Told us all about you, too. Oh, so that's it. Uh, just a moment now until I add up these two bodies. You wouldn't happen to know where he might be now, this manager of mine? Oh, he always sleeps very late. However, I can send up a boy. Oh, no, wait a minute. It won't be necessary. Hello, Mr. Thurston. Welcome to San Juan, which is noted for its coffee. And the senoritas are not bad either. Well, Pagan, your rich American has arrived. Hmm? Oh, oh, I had to use my ingenuity, but I knew you would want nothing but the best. From the size of this bed, it looks like I've already had it. But, but you have no idea how expensive things are here. Something to do with the exchange rate, I think. Yeah, I must be terrific. Did you get my telegram? Oh, yes, Mr. Thurston. I have it right here somewhere. Never mind. I don't want it. Huh? What did you find out about Nestler? Well, uh, for one thing, I found out he owns the Messler Plantation Company. Well, I told you that in the telegram. Oh. Oh, oh. Well, 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 he's very mysterious. In what way? Well, nobody in San Juan knows anything about him. He lives in a great big house on a plantation a few miles from town. And people don't see him for maybe months at a time. Well, then who actually runs the business of the plantation down there? Well, that's what you're going to find out right now. Goodbye, Mr. Egg. What? See you later. No, pay you Hey. I'm afraid you're going to think me terribly forward, Mr. Thurston. Uh, no, that's quite all right. Hey, Pig. Well, yes, it's uh, quite all right. Thank you. That was most complimentary. Oh, on, on the contrary, it was far from adequate, Miss... Miss um... Messler. My uncle owns the Messler plantation. Oh. You have heard of him, perhaps. Who hasn't? But I haven't heard that he had such a lovely niece, Miss Messler. Oh, please call me Lorena. Everyone in San Juan does. Lorena. The queen. Ah. 
But how do you happen to know me? Oh, you are far too modest, Mr. Thurston. Why, all San Juan has heard of you and what it is you are going to do. Oh, am I? I'm so excited about it. But after all, a hotel lobby is really no place to get uh, better acquainted, is it? Hardly. So, won't you please come to dinner at the plantation this evening? Please say you will. I'll be looking forward to it. And with a double reason now. You see, I've been hoping for a chance to meet the fabulous Mr. Messler. Oh? Well, that is too bad because, you see, it won't be possible. No? No. Unfortunately, my uncle left by plane for the States two days ago. I hope you won't be too disappointed. Oh, how could I be? After all, I've met you. You are very sweet. And I promise I will do everything I can to make your visit interesting. Come in, Mr. Thurston. How do you like our room? Not bad, eh? Hang on. What am I supposed to be doing here in San Juan? Doing? Oh, you know, look up Mr. Messler and try to find out what happened. No, no, not that. No? Oh, well, maybe I did talk a little too much. No. But everyone expected it, yes. So, so what could I do? What did you do? I, I think I said that you were a movie producer who was going to make a film here. So that's why she... Well... Pagan, maybe I do owe you something after all. Well, thank you, Mr. X. You haven't told that to anyone? Oh, not one soul, I swear. But the father of my father... Now, never mind your relative. Oh. What about this niece of Methus? Does she run the plantation with the shipping, the whole business, while her uncle's not around? Not exactly. There's sort of a manager named uh, Carl Herzberg. Only he's not here now. Well, where is he? He sailed to New York on the Samba. Oh, the sister ship to the Bolero. Uh-huh. Yeah, that disappeared, remember? Which reminds me, did you know that the Samba is due back here today? Yeah, I know. Good. Uh, now about what you owe me, Mr. X. Hey, uh, uh, it comes for exactly $164.20. We're even. But part of that bill is for the car. What car? The one I rented for you. I knew you'd want it. It's very thoughtful of you. Yes, very thoughtful, as a matter of fact, because tonight, Pagan... I have a dinner engagement. Good. I'll get dressed right away. You're going to drive me there and wait outside to bring me home. Oh, what? Pagan, now comes your day of reckoning. More brandy, Ken? No, thanks. No, it's so late. I think I'd better say good night. Oh. Hope this won't be the last time. Oh, let us say the first of many. I hope your plans keep you here a long, long time. Perhaps they will. You know, you know, you're an amazing person. Really? In what way? Well, for one thing, the way you take charge of this place in your uncle's absence. Oh, I'm used to it. You see, when he's here, he seldom leaves the house and never has anyone in. And he's always going off on some unexpected trip. He's a strange man, Ken. Oh, he certainly throws a lot of responsibility on you. Oh, I'm afraid you're overrating me. Actually, our manager, Mr. Hertzberg, runs things, even when my uncle is at home. So, I'm just a very ordinary girl after all. If you're ordinary, Lorena, the world needs more mediocrity. I gotta go. Well, I'll go to the door with you. Tomorrow morning, Ken? Definitely. Oh, uh, about your movie, Ken. Have you picked a star for it yet? Matter of fact, I haven't yet. Oh, well, please call on me if I can help in any way, any time. There's no one I'd rather call on for help. Oh. oh, Ken, I have been very lonely here until today. Lorena. Oh, Ken... Oh, good night, Ken. Good night, Lorena. One moment, please, Mr. Thurston. Eh, yeah, who are you? My name is Hertzberg. I manage this plantation. Oh, then the samba has done. Congratulations, Mr. Hertzberg. So? 
For what? For having sailed on the Samba instead of the Bolero. I didn't stop you to engage in small talk, Mr. Thurston, but rather to advise you that such scenes as the one which just occurred will not be repeated. Your duties as manager include spying on your employer's niece? Lorena is somewhat susceptible to uh, charm, shall we say. I am not. That's kind of obvious. I'm afraid you don't understand me, nor the possible dangers of this tropical climate. It's a climate which can be quite deadly, Mr. Thurston, to someone who doesn't understand. Really? Now, I like it. And you? How long have you been here? Approximately one year, but I don't... do you see? You're perfectly healthy. No, Mr. Hertzberg, your argument doesn't hold water. I see. Very well. But I think you'll find that while the climate may agree with some, it can seriously disagree with others. And until it's tested, a man's personal reaction is something of an unknown quantity. A quantity which, in algebra, might be called X. Good night, Mr. Thurston. moment we continue with Frigidaire's Man Called X, originated by J. Richard Kennedy. This is Wendell Niles speaking. And now to continue with Frigidaire's Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. Mr. X has gone to San Juan, Puerto Rico, to look up a certain Mr. Messler, who owned a mysteriously missing freight ship, the Bolero. So far, Mr. X has found neither Messler nor the Bolero, but he did have dinner last night with Messler's niece, the beautiful Lorena. But now it's the next morning, and while Pagan cheerfully carries out his assignment of scouting the local bars for local gossip, Ken sits in the office of the bank talking to the manager. So, as you can see on the map, Senor Thurston, almost all of the plantation lands which may be available for purchase lie to the south of the city, along the main highway. Well, I had more in mind the purchase of a plantation north of town, possibly along the lake shore. Oh, unfortunately, that's impossible. A few months ago, yes, but not now. Why a few months ago? Well, because at that time, the Messler plantation still had uh, several lakefront tracks they were offering for sale, but they're taken now. You mean Mester's been selling off his land? Oh, the major portion of his holdings during the past year. Why? Then you, Thurston, I stopped long ago trying to explain that old gentleman's reasons for anything. You know him well? Oh, I believe I've seen him only four times in all the years the bank has dealt with him. You might say that my familiarity with Senor Messler applies more to his signature than his face. I see. Well, thanks for your trouble, sir. Oh, not at all. Would you care to have lunch with me? Maybe another time. I've accepted an invitation to go horseback riding this morning. Oh, in that case, I hope you find your ride enjoyable. Thanks. I have an idea I shall find it quite enjoyable. Yeah, mine's gone, too. You you handled that horse beautifully, Lorena. Thank you. Oh, I don't know when I've ridden like that. Oh, I'm glad we stopped here. Isn't this a lovely view of the lake? Beautiful. You get the impression you're, you're on a tropic island. We're not, though. It's really no more than a few hundred feet to the house. Then what's that long, sort of low building over there through the underbrush? Where? Oh, Oh, one of the warehouses. Well, why the man on guard with a rifle? Oh, that's Carl Hertzberg's idea. Some of the workmen were stealing things. Hertzberg seems to be quite a little watchdog. How much do you know about him? Hardly anything. My uncle hired him when the last manager left suddenly. Well, where did he come from? What did he do before? I don't know. I think he mentioned having been a watchmaker at one time. Watchmaker? You know... I've been a little afraid of him. In fact, 
I've been afraid a good part of the year I've lived here. I've been alone so much for one thing. So you're not alone now. I know. And I'm not afraid now. Uh, come on, Ken. <laughs> I'll race you down to the boat landing. Uh, come on, boy. <laughs> Mr. Thurston. Pagan, I began to wonder where you were. It's been very tiring work running about all day from this bar to that bar yeah, to that it bar. Looks like it. You find out anything about Hertzberg for me? Not a thing. The man is an enigmatical sphinx. Tell me, did you um, talk to any of the Samba's crew? That I did not do. My cousin Egan, may he rest in peace, peace tried that tried that thing in New oh, York. Oh, I know you. Yeah. But local gossip has it that you've confined most of your questioning to a little number named Rosita. Is that right? <laughs> Mr. Thurston. Miss, she's strictly business of the expense account type. I, I have found Rosita to be a bottomless well of information. Strictly business. Hey, you you're slipping. Now, listen. You better rest up from your tiring day because tonight we're going to have a try at breaking into a warehouse. And it's guarded. Good. Why are we going to do it? Well, for one thing, I've always resented no visitor's signs. What's more, we may find Mr. Messler there. Or what's left of him. Mr. Messler flew to the States three days ago where the senorita said so. Messler must have been having a little joke with her pig on. According to the passenger list at the airport, he hasn't taken a plane out of here. Still out cold? Like a fish. Good. You haven't heard anyone outside? Only the crickets. Hmm. Did you find Mr. Bessler? Yeah. Where is he? I mean... I'll tell you later, Pagan. We oh. haven't got much time. Come on now. Try not to fall over anything in the dark. One more thing I'd like to find, and I think it may be here in the warehouse. Wait a second. Uh-oh. Steel door. The door? Is it locked? I can't find the... No, it isn't. Let's have a look. Easy now. Watch your step. Some kind of a little room. Empty, maybe. Maybe empty now, but... No, it isn't. There are several cases here. What's in there, Mr. Thurston? Wait a minute. I'll strike a man. You do, and you'll find yourself wearing a halo. Those are cases of dynamite. The, di the dynamite? No, Mr. Thurston, we'll go now. Right now. We'll go. Hmm? Not yet. What? Uh, I have a gun here that says neither one of you is going anywhere. <laughs> well, Mr. Hertzberg, so the little watchdog is still on duty. Unfortunately for you, Thurston, it's too bad you didn't take my advice and leave this unhealthy climate. Leaving Puerto Rico didn't help the 21 seaman on the Bolero very much. Oh, so you found the answer to that. Look, dynamite, a missing ship, a watchmaker who could easily rig up an efficient time detonating device. All makes the problem rather simple. Quite so. Now, will you be kind enough to toss your gun over toward the door, Thurston? Sorry, I'm afraid I can't. You see, I don't have a gun. Fine. In that case... In that case, just think of what will happen if you fire toward these cases of dynamite. So, we seem to reach a temporary stalemate. Well, that's your move, Hertzberg. I think I'll postpone it for the moment. At least until I go liquidate a gold mine. However, just to make sure I can still find you here. There. Amuse yourselves, gentlemen. I won't be gone long. Phew. I have just died a million times, Mr. Thurston. But what did he mean? What's he going to do? You have an idea. Mr. Thurston, we've got to get out of here. She's going to come back. We can't just... Yeah, quiet, quiet, quiet. Somebody's out there. In. Lorena. Then you expected her? Hardly. In here, Lorena. Oh, Ken, I have found you... You're all right. Fine. How did you happen to come here? It's Carl. I followed him. Oh, Ken, he's done something terrible. I don't know what. I even think my uncle may be held prisoner here instead of being in the States. He was... What was that? Yes, Lorena. Mr. Nestler was being held prisoner. Then Carl's killed him. And now he'll come back here and kill us. Ken, you've got to do something quick. 
What would you suggest? You have a gun? No. I brought one. Here. When he comes back here, you must shoot first. It's our only chance. La Reina, the Queen. What? And with me cast as chief executioner and the double cross of her partner, so there'll be no spitting of the spoils. Uh, I don't know what you mean. No? You told me your uncle took a plane to the States three days ago. Well, that's what Carl said. He said he took him to the airport. Oh, it isn't very flattering to be regarded as a complete fool. What are you saying? La Reina, three days ago, Carl was on board the Samba, 500 miles at sea. You... Somebody's coming, Mr. Thurston. Yeah, uh, here. Look out, Carl. Mr. X has a gun. Carl! No. I doubt very much that Carl will be able to hear you, La Reina. You! My thanks for the loan of your gun, Mr. Thurston. It came in very handy, just as you thought it might. Who are you? Permit me to introduce myself. I am John Messler. <laughs> oh, Mr. X, I'm beginning to see the light. Sure. Messler's habit of seldom showing his face outside his house was well known. So it was easy for them to hold him prisoner in the cell of that warehouse for nearly a year, starving him. Forcing him to sign the deeds and checks necessary to convert the estate into cash. Mr. Thurston, it has all become as clear to me as... Uh... As this wine? Yes, please, just a little more. Uh, thank you. And Lorena, she's not Mr. Messler's niece? Just an enterprising lady who teamed up with Carl Hertzberg and came here about a year ago. Ah, women. They are fleas in a life ointment. I said it's a pretty thirsty flea you've had on the expense account for the past week. Uh, Rosita? Strictly an ex-business acquaintance. Uh, since when? Well, since I discovered a horrible fact, Mr. Thurston, I found Rosita cared only for my money. Which is to say, your money, of course. There's a nice distinction running around there. Money. <laughs> nothing yet. Uh, after all, what is it? Just money. It means nothing at all to me. <laughs> this wine is wonderful stuff. I'll have to take some along, just for financial purposes. Uh... You know, there is one thing that is not quite clear to me yet. Why did they want to sing their own ball? That seems very silly. Well, the insurance paid on. Oh. The Valero was heavily insured. That's why the Bureau first became interested in the disappearance. Of course, to a man like you, to whom money means nothing, half a million dollars would seem silly. <laughs> Frigidaire star, Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And please let me remind you that daylight saving time goes into effect in some parts of the country next week. So if your area remains on standard time, tune in one hour earlier for our broadcast. As usual, Leon Velasco will be along as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, where next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> Frigidaire's Man Called X is directed by Jack Johnstone, with music composed and conducted by Johnny Green. Tonight's story was written by Les Crutchfield. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. When you read about people being injured, people being killed in traffic accidents, do you ever stop to think, why, that might have happened to me? It's worth thinking about, and it's worth doing something about. The best thing to do is to obey all traffic laws. Yes, whenever you drive, whenever you walk along streets or highways, be careful. The life you save may be your own. This is Wendell Niles speaking for Frigid Air, made only by General Motors. Remember, if your community remains on standard time, tune in one hour earlier next week for Frigid Air's Man Called X. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Subscribe for more videos. Secret Agent K-7 returns. America's number one adventurer, K-7, former United States secret agent who operated in 22 countries, on land, on sea, and in the air, brings you another story of today. Here is K-7. Ladies and gentlemen, in the troubled world of today, those who attempt to upset the peace between nations have many means at their disposal. One of the most powerful is the radio and the illegal use of this medium has repeatedly brought nations to the verge of crises. Stories of the illegal use of radio overseas appear in newspapers frequently. The menace is very real. It is such a story which my old friend John Holbrook introduces now. Thank you, K-7. A few months ago, international spies succeeded in making the people of a nation, which we shall not name, distrustful of their government and their leaders. It was a carefully planned move involving even the bribing of officials, and thousands of citizens were listening to the radio speeches of the agitators. These came on the air each afternoon and each evening. Our story opens as Special Agent Z and his assistant, Patricia Norwood, wait for such a broadcast. It'll take a minute for the tubes to warm up, Pat. But Z, how do you know when the broadcast will come on? I don't know, and neither does anyone else except the plotters. However, it's usually about now. Here, come over to this window. All right. You see the knot of people gathered down there? Yes. This thing has actually reached a point where the people crowd in front of stores and listen to what the agitators say on the broadcast. But what of the police? They make no attempt to break up the gatherings. I've even seen one listening. Pat, unless we act fast, there'll be revolution here. It's coming. The signs are unmistakable. Hello, citizen. Listen, Pat, here's the broadcast. The men who head your government have again taken steps against you the people they are supposed to represent. These criminals, so-called lawmakers, who take your money in taxes and give you nothing in return, have now taken further steps to curb your liberties. Daily they have blocked out these broadcasts, denying you the right to listen to the truth. However, tonight there will be a broadcast which will not be interrupted. It will come on the air at exactly nine o'clock. It's a message that will be very important. Every citizen should listen. V, yeah. what does it mean? I don't know, Pat. This message will be repeated in an hour or two. Now I must warn you of another menace to your liberty. Your crooked lawmakers have today imported two spies. One who calls himself Special Agent Z and a woman assistant. You're talking of us. Listen. These two have been brought here to stop these broadcasts. They must be driven from the country. I want you to know them, and so I am going to describe them. We are fortunate. That interference was caused by a government station coming on the air on the same wavelength. It's the method used to block out these broadcasts. But he had just started to describe us these. How do they know, well, that we're here? I don't know, Pat, but be thankful that our description didn't reach the people. We'd be mobbed on the streets. This is a carefully laid plot, and one that we've got to stop before night. But how? And listen carefully. The man, whoever he is, 
may have given us a lead when he said this message will be repeated within an hour. Does that mean that he'll finish his description of it then? Well, I don't know. But when he repeats his message, we'll be in a plane circling over the city. We'll use a direction finder and locate the part of the city the broadcast comes from. You mean the radio direction finder will tell us where the transmitter is located? Well, it'll give us a good idea. Now let's get out to the airport. We've got less than an hour to get ready and get into the air. short time later, Z and Patricia Norwood took off in Z's plane and began to circle lazily over the city. Pat was at the plane's controls while Z worked over the radio direction finder. Both wore earphones. It's been over an hour since the last broadcast, Z. Yes. We should hear something soon. Attention, all citizens. Here it comes. It's weak. Circle to the left. Every I'll swing at once, Z. We're headed in the right direction. The signal's getting louder. Keep going straight ahead. I will will be be. interrupted by interference, which has blocked our past messages to you. For on this occasion, we have taken steps to see that this. The station must be right under us. The The signal is cold. There's the interference again. Get off the radio. Now look below us. A group of buildings. What are they, Z? Those are the buildings of the Capitol, Pat. The Capitol? The government buildings? But the broadcast couldn't come Oh, it doesn't seem possible, does it? But we know officials have been bribed. Well, we'll soon find out. Turn back to the airport. We're going to land and do some investigating. A few minutes later, Z entered the office of the Patriot, who was responsible for bringing him into the case. There, he asked a few terse questions. How many radio transmitters are there in the communications building? Three. Two regular transmitters and one emergency set. I see. And do all three of them operate from the city's power lines? Yes, of course. Oh, no. Two of them operate from the city's power. The third, the emergency transmitter has its own bank of storage batteries. Then if the city's power should fail, that transmitter would continue to function? Yes. It was designed for use in case of floods or storms. That's all I want to know. Now, I want two passes. One that'll give entry to the communications building, the other to the city power plant. Hurry, I have less than three hours before nine o'clock. night, shortly before nine o'clock, a lone figure paused at the gate which led to the great generating plant which served the city with electricity. She showed her pass to the watchman. Here is my pass, monsieur. Uh-huh. Yeah, it seems official, mademoiselle, but you will have to go on alone. I cannot leave my post. There are but two men on duty in the turbine room at night. If I call one... Oh, that will not be necessary. I can find my way. Thank you, monsieur. All right. The door is straight ahead, mademoiselle. The hum of the great mercury turbines guided Pat to the door of the turbine room. She opened it cautiously. Two men stood before a large switchboard. A small radio was on the desk at their side. It was one half minute before nine o'clock. The men were watching the clock. Pat made her way behind the switchboard without being seen. It's almost time. At exactly nine o'clock, we will pull the switch and plunge the west end of the city into darkness. Then Papula will speak. Yeah, 20 seconds. Gota, lock the door. We should have done it an hour ago. No one must enter here until Papula's speech is over. I'll take care of it. Hey, the key. Good. Remove the telephone receiver from the hook. When I pull this switch, the government buildings and the section around them will be in darkness. Now, most of the government officials live in that neighborhood. We do not want the fools calling. People in the West End will not be able to hear Papula. Their radios will be silent. 
with no electricity. Yeah, what of it? I just finished telling you that mostly government officials live there. It is better if they do not hear what is in store for them. Now, we are ready. The power is off. Papula can speak without interference. Listen. Good evening, fellow citizens. Tonight, my message comes to you in full. It will not be blocked out by interference from the government stations. We have taken care of that. The electricity which runs the other transmitters has been turned off. Now, I can talk to you. I can tell you what we have to do of the acts which we are to carry out tonight. Put up your hands and stop talking. I place you under arrest, Marius Popula. What was that? What has happened? Yes, something is wrong. Did you hear the words? I place you under arrest? Yes. Papula has been seized. Hey, quick, throw the switch. They will come here for us. Wait. We must be sure. Listen. Your radio is dead. Papula has been arrested. Someone has told the officials. We must throw the switch and put the lights on. Citizens, Marius Papula and his men have just been placed under arrest. <laughs> It is true. Do you hear? Shut up. He had planned to seize your government, to rob it, and to rob you. In just a minute, your president will address you. However, first I have a private message for my assistant. Pat, seize the men at the power plant. But did you hear that? What does it mean? It means that I'm here what? to place you under arrest. Huh? Put your hands over your head. Both of you. She, she was hidden behind the switchboard. Who are you? I am Special Agent Z's assistant. Keep your hands up. What? What are you going to do with us? Perhaps if you listen, you will find out. Hold your prisoners, Pat. Help is on the way to you. It should arrive within a minute or two. And now, citizens, may I present your president, the man who has crushed this plot against your government. Listen to his message of peace. My countrymen, tonight might well have seen the end of our great republic. We were on the very brink of disaster. Once again, Special Agent Z and his assistant, Patricia Norwood, have helped avert war and seize the men who plotted against the government. Radio is a great force in the world today. It must be used as the voice of peace, a voice that spreads goodwill among nations. Listen for my next story. This is K-7 speaking.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. I just looked under the nearest parimutuel window. Have a seat, Steve. Okay. You know, of course, I was going to get even on that next race. I'm afraid this can't wait until the next race, Steve. I'll have your credentials and plane ticket at my desk when you're ready for them. All right, thanks, Ruth. Sending me off into the wild blue yonder again, Commissioner? You're flying to Tangier. Tangier? Look, I don't even have a veil. You won't need one. Ever hear of a man named Captain Rock? Yeah, sort of a soldier of fortune, isn't he? Yes, a man who'd do anything for anybody, if the price was right. Here's a picture of him. Take a look. Mm. Hey, he looks like me. Quite a little, Steve. We think you could pass for Captain Rock almost anywhere. Hey, wait a minute. What do you mean, pass for him? It's a very dangerous game, Steve, but I'm asking you to play it for us. Mm. Putting it bluntly, you're going to pose as Captain Rock in Tangier. You'll be a decoy. Oh, great. Look, uh, maybe Captain Rock won't like the idea. He's in no position to object, Steve. Last night in Tangier, Captain Rock was stabbed to death. Huh? How do I go about impersonating a dead man? His death has been kept a secret. He was found right after he was stabbed and was taken to the hospital in Tangier under heavy police guard. He died in the hospital. We want his killers to think they missed. Oh, so they'll come after me, huh? Hey, this sounds like a fine job. Yes, well, we've got to find out who killed him and why. Look, you better fill me in on the background. Why is Rock so important to us? Now, there's not time to go into that now, Steve. Your plane leaves in half an hour. But Inspector Laborde... In Tangier, we'll give you the entire background. Go directly to his office when you arrive. Inspector Laborde in Tangier. Okay. Steve, this is a vital job you're going to do and a very dangerous one. You'll be up against clever, ruthless opposition. But we've got to find out who killed Captain Rock. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is proud to present Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places in the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Steve Mitchell is en route to Tangier in North Africa by plane. Meanwhile, in a spacious villa on the outskirts of Tangier, a man waits, slowly sipping a glass of sherry. The door opens, and a slender native enters the room. Good evening, Joshua Effendi. Ali, at last. Certainly took you long enough to get back here to make your report to me. I thought it best to remain in hiding for a day, Effendi. Perhaps you were right. But come... Tell me exactly what happened. Yes, Effendi. I met Captain Rock at the shop of a thousand bells the night before last, as you instructed me to. I told him that I was to conduct him to the man who had arranged his escape from the Istanbul prison. Was he suspicious at all? He did not seem to be. But he said he did not understand why his escape from prison had been arranged. I told him he would find that out later. Good. Good. We drove to a deserted road outside the city... And then I stabbed him. Captain Rock is dead, Joshua Effendi. (laughs) You've done well, Ali. And you'll be paid accordingly. I'm going to the airport to purchase a ticket to Cairo. My job here is finished. I would like a ticket to Cairo on the first available plane. Very well, sir. Taxi. Hey, taxi. Uh, Here is your ticket, sir. Wait, that man. Taxi. Right here, Effendi. Welcome to Tangier, Effendi. May I show you the sights of the city? No, just take me to the police station. Oh, right away, Effendi. 
That was Captain Rock. But Rock is dead. I, 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 I beg your pardon? Never sir. mind the ticket to Cairo. I still have some unfinished business here in Tangier. No, it cannot be true, Joshua Effendi. Captain Rock is dead. You stupid fool, Ollie. I saw him at the airport just now. You bungled the job the night before last, after all. No, no, it could not be. I stabbed him to death in the car. I, Ali, I do not miss. Did you wait until you were sure he was dead before you left? I, well, you see, Joshua Effendi, Out I... with it, Ali! Uh, uh, well, the police patrol came down the road right afterward. It was necessary for me to depart quickly. That's what I thought. You did bungle the job, stupid, One stupid more fool. chance, Effendi. Just give me one more chance, and this time I will make sure... No! It is too late for that, Ali. You had an opportunity, and you failed me. No. No, Effendi, please. I... No! 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 One chance is all I ever give anyone, Ali. From now on, I will handle this job myself. <laughs> Your credentials are in order, uh, Monsieur Mitchell. Uh, please have a seat. Thank you, Inspector Laborde. Your commissioner notified me to expect you. You did well to come here to my office as soon as you arrived in Tangier. We do not want you to be seen in the city until you understand the situation thoroughly. Well, right now I don't understand much of anything. I think you'd better start at the beginning. Of course. Look at this map. Hmm? A year ago, these two European countries were on the verge of signing a treaty. Your country was backing them completely and was very anxious for that treaty to go through. It meant peace and security for this entire area of Europe. I see. What happened to it? On a certain day, a representative from each country was to meet and sign the treaty on the border. But that meeting never took place. Why not? One of the representatives was assassinated on the way to the meeting point. The mutual suspicion which resulted from the incident was enough to scrap the treaty. Hmm. But what's all this got to do with Captain Rock? Ah, I wish to show you a portion of a newsreel on this film projector. Will you turn off the light, please? Okay. Merci. I will start the projector now. This was taken near the border of the two countries involved on the day the treaty was to be signed. What do you see there, Monsieur Mitchell? Just a black sedan. Man in the back seat and driver in front. The man in the back seat was the diplomat who was assassinated shortly afterward. Hmm. Now, look more closely at the driver. What? Hey, it's Captain Rock. Captain Rock. You may turn the lights back on now. Ah, merci. You think Captain Rock killed that diplomat? No, but we think he was in on the plan in some way. At a certain point in the trip, instead of turning to the left, as he was supposed to do, he suddenly turned to the right, into a blind alley. That is where the shooting took place. I see. Well, then, if Rock was in on the plan, that means he knew who killed that diplomat. That is precisely the point, Mitchell. We believe that interests hostile to that treaty deliberately assassinated that diplomat to block the treaty. Your commissioner also believes that if they can be exposed for what they are and linked to the killing then the treaty has a chance of going through after all. Yeah. Well, what happened to Captain Rock after the shooting? Interpol in Paris has supplied us with that information. I have it right here. Rock mm. uh, went into hiding. He was arrested on a minor charge in Istanbul two months ago and imprisoned there. He probably figured that that Istanbul jail was a good hiding place. Oh, undoubtedly. But last week, there was a very skillfully arranged jailbreak. Captain Rock escaped. We want to find out who arranged that escape. Because it is our belief that the one responsible for it is the killer who realized that he was not safe as long as Rock was alive. So that's why I'm supposed to impersonate Rock? Exactly. I mm. think we will be able to make the killer believe that he missed the first time. So he'll come after me. <laughs> you know, this sounds like a nice friendly little pastime where a guy could wind up dead. There is no point in minimizing the danger, but this assignment is a vital one. Look, uh, did you get anything out of Rock before he died? No. But a few hours before his death, he was seen at Hassim's. Hassim's? What's that? It's a cafe here in Tangier. It may mean nothing, on the other hand... Well, I guess that'll be my first stop, huh? Oui. Monsieur Mitchell? 
One thing I must make very clear to you. Yeah? When you walk out of this office, you will be Captain Rock. You cannot return here until this job is finished one way or the other. Why not? The interests that we think are behind this have eyes and ears everywhere. We must do our best to convince them. Therefore, I am the only one in Tangier who knows who you really are. Even now, your picture has been distributed to the force as that of Captain Rock. To the rest of the police, you will be Captain Rock. To be pursued and captured if possible. Oh, fine. I don't have enough to do trying to find out who's behind all this. I have to play hide-and-seek with the police, too. Oh, I regret it. It's unavoidable. Well, <laughs> look, suppose I get in a spot. Isn't there anyone who can help me? I have considered that possibility. I will have one of my detectives who will make himself known to you at Hasim's Café. How will I know him? He will approach you and he will say, Hasim stocks fine wines here. You will ask him if he is an employee of the place. And he will reply, no. Not an employee, a connoisseur. Fine wines, connoisseur. Okay, I've got it. Keep undercover for the rest of the day and be at Hasim's at seven tonight. Okay. Monsieur Mitchell, I do not need to warn you to be careful. Because if you are not... I am afraid it will cost you your life. Welcome to my humble cafe, Effendi. Would you like Hasim to show you to a table? Oh, this one right here will do. Looks like I'm in time for the floor show. <laughs> yes, Effendi. I... Captain Rock. Huh? For a moment, I did not recognize you. But you are Captain Rock. Uh, yeah, but let's not spread it around, Hassim. Oh, but of course, Effendi, I forgot you were wanted by the police. But you risk capture to come here to see Adida. Adida? Your sweetheart. See? She is dancing now. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she looks even more beautiful than the last time I saw her. <laughs> she is the sweetheart of all Tangier. But she loves only you. I will go to signal her that you are here. She will be overjoyed. I hope so. <laughs> Maybe this deal won't be too bad after all. I beg your pardon. Huh? Is this your first visit to Hasim's cafe? Why, uh, no. I used to come here a lot. Why, who are you? Allow me to congratulate you on your excellent taste in coming here. Hasim stocks fine wines. Oh? Are you an employee? Not an employee. A connoisseur. I see. Inspector Laborde sent me. Let us go someplace where we can talk. No, not now. I know what you look like now. That's all that's necessary. Just manage to be around if I need you. But I think we should go outside and discuss... No, look. Hassim's heading this way. Beat it. Very well. I will leave by the back door. Yeah. I signal to Yadid. I pointed you out. See? She has her eyes on you now. Yeah. Nice eyes, too. Uh, thanks, Hassim. She is coming straight here to your table. Yeah. Hasim, uh, don't you think sweethearts should be let alone? <laughs> but of course, Effendi. I understand. I understand. <laughs> Darling. Hello, Yadida. Oh, darling, you must be careful. Joshua's here. Huh? I saw him. I... Wait. What's the matter? You... You are not... Oh, I beg your pardon, Effendi. I have made a mistake. Hey, wait a minute. Yadida, come back here. Yeah, looks like I didn't fool her any. Hassim. Hassim. Yes, Effendi. Where's your Dita's dressing room? Oh, you have quarreled already. Such a pity, such a pity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I want to make up. Where is her dressing room? Where it has always been, Captain Rock. Through that curtain. The room at the end of the hall. Thanks. <laughs> you will make it up, then all will be well again. Room at the end of the hall. Yeah, there it is. She was trying to warn me about something. Yadida. Yadida. Hey. Yadida. What happened? A knife. Who did it? Joshua. Who's he? Joshua. Look, Yadida, so you know I'm not Captain Rock, but I'm trying to find out who killed him and what's behind it all. Can you tell me anything that'll help? Shop of a thousand bells. Shop of a thousand bells? Where's that? Street Bazaar. <sighs> Yadida. Yadida. She's dead. What is it, Captain Rock? What has happened? Yadida. She's dead. What? Yadida dead? Yadida. A knife wound. 
You did this, Captain Rock. You killed Yadida. Now, look. You had a quarrel. You stabbed her. Police! 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 <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the second act of Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy. But first, we'd like to call your attention to another fast-moving adventure mystery. Now on Sundays, hear Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Every week, glib Dick Diamond fights his way to fame, fortune, and a red-headed girlfriend over most of these same NBC stations. And Dick Powell continues to delight listeners with a tune or two on almost every program. This delightful mixture of rough-and-tumble action and smooth, sweet lyrics weekly brings joy to listeners who dial the NBC way. Enjoy this novel, pulse-paced action drama every Sunday. Richard Diamond is another fast-moving NBC adventure mystery wrapped up and delivered every Sunday afternoon over most of these NBC stations. Now back to Act Two of Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. The time, ten seconds later. The place, Asim's Cafe in Tangier. Steve Mitchell, posing as the notorious Captain Rock, is still standing over the body of Yadida, the beautiful dancing girl, as Hasim, the proprietor, rushes down the hall to her dressing room. Hasim suspects Steve of killing Yadida. She loved you, and you killed her. Police! Shut up! As long as we're throwing accusations around, you got here in an awful hurry just now, Hasim. How come? I do not know what you are talking about. Police! Quiet. Police! Take your hand off my mouth. Let go of me. In that dressing room. It will do you no good. I will still call the police. I know. But this way I'll have five minutes to start. Now get in there. Commissioner, Steve's calling from Tangier. He's on the line now. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Hello? Hi, Commissioner. I can only talk a minute. I'm calling from the second floor of a little hotel here in Tangier. Well, how's everything? Right now, it's hotter than a two-bit pipe. What do you mean? When you sent me over here, you didn't tell me I was supposed to play tag with the police, too. Well, we had to make things look convincing, Steve. Yeah. Well, right now, they look very convincing. Rock's girlfriend just got herself killed, and I'm the grade-A suspect. What? Yeah. She was trying to warn me about something before she died. She mentioned a place called the Shop of a Thousand Bells in a bazaar. I guess that's my next stop. You're working alone, Steve? But really alone. Inspector Laborde sent a man to me at Hassim's Cafe. But I had to leave in such a hurry I wasn't able to contact him again. Have you made any contact with the people who engineered Captain Rock's jailbreak? Not yet. Maybe I'll have better luck at the Shop of the Thousand Bells. Look, uh, I better hang up. I don't want to stay in one place any longer than I have to. This town is probably jumping with cops right now, and they're all looking for me. I'll try to call you again as soon as I have anything new to report. All right, Steve. Be careful. Yeah. So long, Commissioner. Clerk. Hey, Clerk. Here I am, Effendi. Look, I'd like a little information. I, of course, Effendi. What's the matter? Nothing, Effendi, nothing. You seem pretty nervous all of a sudden. It is nothing, Effendi. Information do you wish? Is there a bazaar around here anywhere? A, a bazaar? I I do. Hey, you really got the jumps, haven't you? A bazaar? Oh yes, say, Fendi. It is not far. Wait a minute. What was that? I, I do not know. I, I a car pulled up outside a police car. So that's why you were nervous. Police, quick! In here! Here he is! Looks like I've got no friends Wait, at police, all. Wait, this way! Must be a back door over there. Quick! There he goes. This bazaar would put Sears Robot to shame. That shop of a thousand bells ought to be around here someplace. Yeah, there it is. Hmm. Good evening, Effendi. Welcome to the shop of a thousand bells. Are you the proprietor here? Yes, Effendi. I am Turhan, at your service. 
You would perhaps like to buy one of these beautiful bells? No, but I'd like a little information. I do not sell information, Effendi. I sell bells. The finest in all Tangier. See, here is one you may like. But... Does it not have a fine tone? Like pure silver. Yeah, yeah. But now indeed, look, uh... it should have such a tone, for it is pure silver. With just the slightest amount of alloy to give it body... You like this bell? That's not what I came for. Oh, I, I, I well, perhaps uh, this uh, other one uh, here. Hmm? Yes, perhaps this one is more to your liking. Look, I don't want to buy a bell. Oh, but Effendi, uh, I have. Effendi, you would like a guide? No. No. I am Mustafa Effendi, the best guide in all Tangier. I no. can show you all the more secret places. No. The beautiful dancing. Girls. Look. I don't want to buy a bell, and I don't want a guide. But I charge oh. very little for my services, if I Hey, beat it, will you? Now, look, Turhan, I don't have much time. I told you I wanted some information from you. But I only have information about my bells, if any. Look, I'm going to try just once more. I was told to come here. Now, if you don't open up and start talking, ah, I'll... Ah, uh... if you want information, why do not you ask me? I, Mustafa, have all the information. What's that? Of course. I have information on all the points of interest here in Tangier. I can show you. Oh, great. Look, will you beat it? Uh, it is a sad thing to her. Nobody wants a guy tonight. Everyone is too interested in the murder of Yadida to go sightsee. Yes, I know. No one will buy my bells either. What's that about Yadida? You have not heard of Fendi. Hmm. Yadida was a beautiful dancing girl, a sweetheart of all Tangier. But tonight, she was murdered by a man called Captain Rock. Oh? The police are scouring the city for him right now. But if the citizens find him first, <laughs> there will be not much left for the police. I guess not. Hey. I see. The police are down at the other end of the bazaar. They are searching everywhere. Look, uh, you still want a job, Mustafa? Oh, but of course, Effendi. You have changed your mind. Yeah, yeah, I've changed my mind. You say you can show me some of the secret places of Tangier? If you like. I like. The more secret, the better. One moment, Effendi. You have changed your mind about the going. Perhaps you will change your mind about the bell. Huh? I'll even buy a bell. Oh, thank you, Effendi. Come on, Mustafa. Let's go. You sure know all the back alleys around town, Mustafa. <laughs> it is my business to know them, Effendi. What would you like to see first? Well, you name it. As long as it's one of those secret places we were talking about. I have a place in mind that I think will appeal strongly to you. Here, in this door, Effendi. I will lead the way. Sure dark in here. There's a flight of stairs at your right, Effendi. Huh? We will descend. Okay. But it's your turn to carry this bill. Somebody's liable to confuse me for a cow in the dark. Of course. Here, put your hand on my shoulder. So, now you will not stumble. Mm. When you say secret, you really mean it, don't you? Uh, certain activities are frowned on by the police. It is necessary to take precautions. Uh, here we are at the bottom. Where to now? See the narrow crack of light under that door at the end of this hall? Mm -hmm. Come. Hey, uh, what kind of a place is this, Mustafa? One beyond the wildest imagination, Effendi. You will see. Here we are. After you, Effendi. Hey, that sudden light blinds me. Your eyes will adjust themselves. Why? Man, that's just a bare room. Here he is. Joshua Fendi, I have brought him to you. Huh? Good work, Mustafa. Well, if he isn't the wine connoisseur from Hasim's, why am I glad to see you? I've been... Hey, why the gun? Wait a minute. Mustafa here called you Joshua just now. Quite right. Yadida told me that Joshua was the guy who stabbed her. Right again. Mustafa, your job is finished. You will be well paid for it. You may go. And take that silly bell with you. Yes, <laughs> Effendi. Well, looks like I've made a little mistake. 
I figured you were the guy Inspector Laborde sent to help me at Hassim's. It did not prove difficult to intercept Laborde's man and learn the password from him. Yeah, I get it. A little late, I guess. Quite a bit too late. Yadita tried to warn me about you. That's why you killed her. Yes. I do not know who you are, except that you are not Captain Rock. Oh? If you were Captain Rock, you would have recognized me instantly at Hassim's cafe. Oh. Captain Rock knew you, huh? Maybe the two of you had done business before. You know, that adds up to an interesting thought. Does it? Sure. The thought that maybe it was you who killed that diplomat Rock was driving the car for. Two of you had that scheme all worked out between you, didn't you? I'm afraid your brilliant deductions can come a little late in the game. You've been looking for Rock ever since so you could kill him and shut his mouth for keeps. That's why you arranged that jailbreak for him in Istanbul. He was difficult to find, but as you see, we could not be safe as long as he was alive. Where is he now? Rock? <laughs> you should have let well enough alone, Joshua. Rock is dead. You got him the first crack out of the box. Indeed. It would seem I was a little harsh with Ali then. Ali? An employee of mine who was assigned to kill Rock. I was forced to shoot him because I thought he had bungled. Yeah, I guess you could easily call that being a little harsh with him. However, I do not believe in regrets. I know now the job's been done. And with you out of the way, things will be complete. Uh-uh. You are not leaving. And to make sure you do not, I will place myself between you and the door. So getting rid of me is the next step, huh? The very next step. Joshua, the police! You fool, Mustafa, that door knocked a gun out of my hand. Thanks, Mustafa. Mustafa, grab the gun. Let, let go of me. With pleasure. Oh, oh. I, I have the gun. Oh, yeah? Oh, on my hand. Oh, Wendy, please. It was not my fault. I did as I was told. You wanted to show me some secret places, Mustafa. Well, here's one I want to show you. Oh, Never send an O for whom the bell tolls, Mustafa. It tolls for thee. Mitchell. <laughs> Mitchell. In here, Inspector. You all right, Mitchell? Yeah, I guess so. I spotted Joshua's agent, Mustafa, and he led me to you. I was hoping I could get to you before it was too late. Well, you gave me a big lift in direct aboard. Mustafa came flying back to tell Joshua you were closing in and knocked the gun out of his hand when he opened the door. There's your man, Inspector. Joshua, there on the floor. Oh, he... He is the one who engineered the political assassination with Captain Rock? That's right. Good. We will give it the widest publicity. When those two countries involved learn who killed that diplomat, perhaps their treaty will go through after all. I hope so. Hey, uh, look, Laborde, do me a favor, will you? After what you have done, anything, Mitchell. Now, the citizens of Tangier still think I killed you, Dita, will you? Give me a police escort out of town? <laughs> I'm not exactly hankering to hang around here, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, that can easily be arranged, Mitchell. Posing as a notorious character does have its disadvantages, I suppose. That's the understatement of the week. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the next time the commissioner wants me to impersonate somebody... Yes? I hope it's a Sunday school teacher in Cedar Rapids. Another episode in the exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif, with music by Bruce Ashley and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us next week at this time when Brian Donlevy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous Assignment comes to you from Hollywood. Tomorrow, you'll hear Fibber McGee and Molly and Bob Hope on NBC. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com.
makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Why are camels by far America's most popular cigarette? Two of the reasons are flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. And no other cigarette offers this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people with normal throats, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Try camels yourself. Then you'll know why Camel leads all other brands by billions of cigarettes per year. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. We make crime pay for a hundred a day. Hi. Plus expenses. Hi, Helen. I'd like to hire you. No cut rates for attractive redheads. But I'm a working girl. I only make $12.40 a week. Doing what? Running an elevator in the automat. My dear girl, there are no elevators in the automat. Oh, no wonder they wouldn't give me a raise. Oh, that's funny. I want to hire you to protect me from a man. He's been bothering me. And just who is this man? His name's Richard Diamond. Well, no wonder he's been bothering you. You've been bothering him. Will you take my case? Just as far as my apartment. We'll open it up and have a party. Oh, you're ridiculous. Only when I try hard. I miss you. I saw you last night. You're just bored. Uh-huh. And I miss you. I'm lonesome. I'm broke. I've got to hang around and pray for a client. Well, I've got a wonderful suggestion. Why don't you come uh -oh. over... oh What? Mr. Diamond? Why, yes. Come in. Rick, who is it? I don't know, but I'm making plans for some extensive research. I didn't mean to disturb you. I don't know how you could help it. Rick, who is that? I'll call you back when I find out. That's a girl. It certainly is. Rick! Bye. Now, Rick, you... Your girl? Hmm? On the phone. Oh, oh, uh, just an old wealthy aunt. She's leaving me her lumber fortune. Oh, nice. Yes, uh, sit down, uh, sit down, Miss, uh... Simpson, Mrs... Oh, yeah. So you have an aunt in lumber. Oh, yes, yes. Broke one day, made a million the next. Discovered trees on her property. Trees on her property? Well, what are you going to do? I came in to hire you, Mr. Diamond. You have a kind heart and plenty of money, I hope. My husband needs protection. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Nothing, nothing. Just snapping at judgments. Occupational hazard. My husband is John Simpson. Perhaps you've heard of him. The John Simpson? Yes. No. He's retired. He discovered oil on his property. Oh, that one. Oh, sure. He was responsible for my bearings burning out at 700,000 miles. He was walking in the garden the other day. Going to drill in a daisy bed? Someone shot at him. Oh. He's all right. They didn't hit him. But I've been terribly worried ever since. Not to mention how your husband feels. He wouldn't call the police and wouldn't give me a reason. But he wants me to protect him. He doesn't even know I've come to see you. Well, what's he going to say? I'm hiring you, and I hope he'll understand. Well, I hope so, too. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I have my own bank account. Oh, no. <laughs> Diamond Detective... Where is she? Well, Aunt Hannah. What? Oh, that's nice, Aunt Hannah. I think spruce is just the thing. Aunt Hannah? Spruce? Richard Diamond, of you... Of course, Aunt Hannah. I'll talk to you later. I knew it. She's a blonde. She sure is, Aunt Hannah. Aunt Hannah. The one with the trees. Thinking about buying a carload of spruce. How nice. Am I hard? Of course. Then let's get out of here. Aunt Hannah might be over with a bat. Spruce? Of course. Well, that's how it started. A lovely blonde named Simpson with a wealthy husband. The husband had ducked a bullet in his garden, and now the lovely blonde wanted protection for him. A few casual jokes, a fat retainer, and Richard Diamond was once more in the ranks of the employed. 
We left the office and climbed in a station wagon. Forty minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the Simpson house on Long Island. Ah, quite a place. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, if you like money. John's probably in the study. May I take your hat? Well, I'll just keep it with me. Your husband might not want a bodyguard. Well, you're back in a hurry. Oh, hello, Ralph. This is Mr. Diamond. Glad to meet you, Mr. Diamond. Hello. Mrs. Ralph Simpson, Mr. Diamond, my stepson. People are more inclined to think we're brother and sister. Oh, I can understand. Ralph was the one who suggested you. Oh, why me? Reputation. Looks like everyone knows about me but the man I'm supposed to protect. And he won't like it much at first. I've already been briefed. But whether he understands or not, it's most necessary he has protection. Well, let's get it over with. Hello, dear. What is this, a convention? Hello, Jane. Hello, Professor. Who is this man, this person with the hat? This is Mr. Diamond, John. Mr. Diamond, this is my husband, Mr. Simpson. Yeah. Charmed. And this is Professor Fisher. How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Hello, Professor. What do you do, young man? Do? Mr. Diamond is a private detective, dear. You what? Now, dear, it was my idea. A, a private detective? Now, just relax. Oh, uh, go away, you quack. I've been relaxing enough. I can't think straight anymore. You've been making me relax so much. If you're not careful... Jane, I told you I didn't want anyone. But after being shot at... Did she pay your retainer, Diamond? Yeah. Did she explain my feeling on this subject? Well, yeah. And you still took the money? I've been poor. I told every one of you I can take care of myself. You know, I think he's right. Here's your retainer, Mr. But, Mr. Simpson. Diamond, please. Where do you think you're going? Out to find the guy who took a shot at you and give him some target practice. You've been paid a retainer to do a job. Now, let's see you do it. Oh, John. I had a feeling you were going to do something like this. Bring in a private detective or a policeman or something. Well, if he's supposed to give me protection, that's what he'll do. Now... All of you, get out of here. I want to talk to this Mr. Diamond. Thank you, John. I'll see you at dinner, dear. Now, you take care of yourself, you old scum. Oh, beat it! Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you, Professor. Well, Mr. Diamond, I have a feeling you might regret this job. It's possible. I really wanted you. I was just keeping up a front for the benefit of the family. Is Professor Fisher one of the family? An old friend. Professor Fisher's a psychologist. After my stroke, he came to help me. He teaches me how to relax. You had a stroke? Three months ago. The professor's been a great help. You have a physician also? I don't need one. Now, as long as you're here to protect me, I might as well tell you what it's all about. Answer me one question first. I'll try. Why not call in the police? I have you. Do I need the police now? When someone takes a shot at someone, I think the police should be the first to know about it. Now, if you are quite done, Mr. Diamond, I'll continue. I'm well done. This morning, if my wife had brought you in, I would have had you thrown out. I didn't want any outsiders mixed up in this. What saves your mind? A letter. Here. Mm-hmm. Pipes. Oh, read it. All right, I will. I missed you in the garden. I won't miss again. You'll pay for Ashanti. Ashanti. It's in Africa. Oh. Twenty years ago, I was in the mining business. I had a partner, Frank Victor. We didn't get along, and there was an argument one day in the mine. It was quite a scrap, and there was a cave in. I got out. Frank didn't. There was an investigation, and I was cleared. Why tell me? The shooting in the garden could have been any crackpot. I didn't want any publicity, so I didn't want any outsiders. Then this letter. I have to confide in someone so they'll know who to look for. Who else knew about it? No one that it should make any difference to. Victor was a bachelor without a family. Could be blackmail. Someone who was there or at the investigation. Then why shoot at me? To give you a good scare. You'll probably get another letter demanding money. This person must be caught. In my position, I can't afford the scandal. Now you say I'm the first one you've told. Outside of your family? I haven't told my family a thing. Even my first wife didn't know about it. Hmm. And you've heard nothing of the incident for 20 years? Nothing. Well, I'll see what I can find out. <laughs> 
I promised John Simpson my confidence. He offered me a large bonus if I should discover who had sent him the threatening letter. Then I borrowed one of his cars and drove back to the city where I looked up an old friend. Lieutenant Levinson, 5th Precinct Police Station. Well, the smiling gumshoe. Well, hello, happiness and light. Want to do me a favor? Depends. Well, if you can strain your arches, I'd like some confidential information on a few people. What is in it for me? <laughs> I promise not to tell anyone what a mercenary policeman you are. I'd like dinner, maybe a big steak. You'll get dinner, maybe chow mein. You got a deal with that restaurant? Certainly. They saved me all the leftover fortunes stuck in the cookies. <laughs> Who are you interested in? I want to know about a young guy named Ralph Simpson, an attractive blonde named Mrs. Simpson, and a man named Professor Fisher. Simpson, Simpson, and Fisher. The boy named Ralph is the son of John Simpson. No. Yeah. The John Simpson? Know who he is? No. Well, unlike my Aunt Hannah, who discovered trees in her property... Your Aunt Hannah? Simpson discovered oil. Oh, that one. His wife is the blonde. Which blonde? The one I want you to check on, Mrs. Simpson. Oh, how silly of me. I should have known. Don't forget the professor. I thought you said his name was Fisher. I did. Now, how does he fit in with Simpson? A friend of the family. Now, you got everything? Sure, sure. Blonde named Mrs. Simpson, a son named Ralph. He's not her son. Well, you just said... He was John's son. Well, who's the blonde? John's other wife? John's other wife. That's right. Oh. He's her stepson. Oh. Well, why the devil do you want me to check on these people? I'm thinking about having a bridge party. Uh, give me the rundown on them. Sure. Uh, Walt. Eh? Put your shoes on. Oh. I gave Walt the rundown he wanted and headed for the newspaper where I knew I could wallow through the morgue file and not be disturbed. I went back 20 years and after wallowing for three or four hours found a small article dated Ashanti, Africa, 1930. It didn't say much more than what John Simpson had already told me. It mentioned the mine cave-in and the pending investigation on the death of Frank Victor. In an addition dated three weeks later, I found the account of the investigation and it verified Simpson's story. I left the newspaper went back to my office to check on a few things. Then, as I was about to leave and close up until I'd finished the case, I got a phone call. Yeah? Diamond? Yeah? This is John Simpson. I took a chance you might be in your office. Oh, I was just coming back out there. This is John Simpson. I took a chance you might be in your office. Yeah, 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 you said that. I'd like you to pick up something for me. Oh, sure. It's a package. It's at a bar on 57th Street. The Blue Pheasant. The Blue Pheasant on 57th Street. Mr. Diamond, this is John Simpson. Yes, yes, I, I, I know, I know. Anything else? Hello. Mr. Simpson. Bring it out to me right away. It's very important. I'll pick it up and bring it right out. Something wrong, Mr. Simpson? Hello? Hello? Hmm. Funny. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? That question was asked a few years ago of 113,597 doctors. The brand name most was Camel. Recently, that question was again asked of tens of thousands of doctors across the country. Doctors in all branches of medicine. And again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to these nationwide surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, smoke the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. Change to Camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. Yes, change to Camels for 30 days and you'll stay with Camels from then on. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see and now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I left the office and went down to 57th Street in the Blue Pheasant, where I told the bartender who I was, and he handed me the package Simpson had wanted me to pick up for him. 
I drove back out to the house on Long Island. The maid let me in, and Mrs. Simpson met me at the study door. Hello. Well, hi. Where's your husband? Oh, I think he's still in the study. He was a little while ago. You going out? Some shopping. You're staying for dinner. Hmm? Where's your stepson? Ralph went out just after you left. Did you want him for something? No, no, no. Just wondered. Then shopping? Oh, this is a package for your husband. He wanted me to pick it up. Dinner's at seven. Uh, Mrs. Simpson. Yes? Professor Fisher. What about him? How long have you known him? Since I've been married to John. Your husband said he was helping him to relax. Yes. Is there something wrong? I don't know. I talked to your husband earlier when he asked me to pick up this package. He sounded rather strange, kept repeating himself. Since he had a stroke, he does that sometimes. Well, shouldn't he have a nurse? He should, but he won't. If something should happen, Professor Fisher's number is in the book on John's desk. Or call the maid. Mm. I'll see you at dinner. Bye. Well, hello, Mr. Simpson. I've got the package. Give me the package. Uh... Mr. Simpson. Give me the package. Uh, are you feeling all right? Give me the package. Well, okay, here. Yeah. Oh, I did some checking on your story about a shatty, and I... Give me the package. You've got it. Mr. Simpson. What? Hey, what's wrong? Mr. Simpson, did you hear me? Oh, I better get the maid. The maid? Maid! Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Ralph? Yeah. What's wrong? I don't know. Your father's acting. It felt like the whole building was coming down around my ears. Ralph and I were thrown back against the wall, and by the time we got up, the study was a smoking black hole. Dad! Dad! I stumbled in after Ralph, but there wasn't much to stumble in after. John Simpson had been blown to kingdom come. You're sure it was Simpson on the phone? Sure, I'm sure it was Simpson on the phone, Walt. He asked you to pick up the package. That's right. He wanted it when I brought it in to him. He wouldn't say anything else. He just demanded that package. Yeah, he'd been pretty sick, hadn't he? Yeah, oh, but a man doesn't go to that much trouble to commit suicide. No. Well, maybe somebody planted the bomb. Look, let's uh, let's check with that bartender at the Blue Fatten. Yeah, I want to talk to the rest of the family first. Oh, by the way, uh, what did you find out about them? No police records. Can't find out much about the professor. He has no practice, no license in the state. Well, let's see if you can find out something. Interested? Yeah. It's funny when a man has a heart condition and won't have a doctor. I'll drag the professor in if you like. No, no, no. You go talk to the family. I'll go over and check for the bartender. Uh, wait a minute, Sherlock. You better tell me how you got into this mess. Okay, Fatty. Guess it won't hurt now. <laughs> I told Walt everything the late Mr. Simpson had told me, then headed back to town in the Blue Pheasant on 57th Street. By the time I got there, the place was pretty well filled, but the bartender who had given me the package that afternoon wasn't in sight. Yeah, well, it be. Uh, where's the bartender who was working this afternoon? How do I know? He just works in the afternoon. Now, where does he live? Why? Well, I'm collecting addresses of bartenders. Now, where does he live? You collect addresses. I collect wise guys. It'll beat it. Hmm. You mean I got to show my little old badge? Your little old badge? Well, when you say so. Complex. He lives at 500 West 157th Street. What's his name? Earl. Earl Collins. No relation to Tom. <laughs> no relation to Tom. Well, what are you going to do? I piled out of the bar and back in the car. Drove across town to 157th Street and 500 West. It was a big apartment house and Earl Collins was registered in 405. I climbed the stairs and knocked. Gave him a few minutes while I knocked my knuckles loose. Then went and dug up the landlady to have her open the door. She was a charmer, about four years older than Grant's tomb with a gin disposition. That would make a lost weekend seem like a Miami vacation. The type that should never have been dug up. Look, honey, I got cleaning to do. Sweetheart. Uh, Sweetheart. Oh, an expression of fond endearment. Look, Buster, don't give me no words longer than one syllable. Cop. Will you? Yes, mother. Mother. 
Sweetheart. Some cop. We'll discuss my qualifications as soon as you open that door. Okay. Sweetheart. There you are. Holy. You said it. Is he dead? As dead as he can get. Mm, still warm. I'm not interested. I need a drink. Did you see him come in? No. Did you see anybody else come in? I've been in my apartment all afternoon. I'm going back there. Killer used something awfully sharp. Neat job. Neat? What are you looking at? What's that other room? Hi, what's wrong? Keep it quiet. What's that room? Oh, good gosh, bedroom. Any other rooms? Hi. Answer me. Bathroom. Fire escape? Huh? Where is it? End of the hall. Look, there's some blood leading to that bedroom. Oh. Now, shh, take it easy. Go downstairs and call Lieutenant Walter Levinson. Oh, at... Lieutenant Levin Walterson. Walter Levinson. Oh, goodbye. At the 5th Precinct. 5th Precinct, oh, yeah. There were several drops of blood leading to the bedroom door. There was a good chance that the killer had been surprised and couldn't get out. I went to the door and tried it as quietly as I could. It gave, and I kicked it open. The shades were down, the room was dark enough to make it difficult to spot anyone. I moved in with my gun in front of me. He was standing right by the door, and he had a knife. Drop it. No. You should have listened. Didn't want to. Sorry, Professor. Don't be. It's better this way. Now look, look, you're in bad shape. You better tell me about it. You fired the shot in the garden and sent the letter? Yeah. Help me sit up. Okay. Yeah. Lean against the wall. There you go. Oh, I, I still can't figure why Simpson had me pick up that bomb. I made him. You did. I've been treating him for nerves. I started giving him a hypnotic when he had his first spells. During one of those times, he reenacted the Ashanti affair. So you decided to blackmail him? At first. Then when you took the case, we decided to eliminate him. We? And Mrs. Simpson and I have been... <coughs> Didn't get much time. Internal bleeding. Police will be here pretty quick. Decided to kill the old man and, and Jane would get the estate. I thought you'd be blown up with him. Mr. Simpson was under some sort of influence when I walked into the study. My profession. After you left, I returned and talked him into a deep sleep. I had him call you at your office. He nearly messed it up. Hypnosis. Nothing unusual. Simple suggestions. And when I walked into the study... He'd been ordered to ask for the package and open it. You mean he was asleep when I walked in? Yes, you see. Uh, it's too late. You have to guess the rest. Bleeding in. Oh. Yeah. Well, you better lie down again, Professor. You'll have to get used to it. Why did he kill the bartender? Well, Walt checked and the professor had been coming into the bar for some time in the afternoons. He made friends with Earl, the bartender, and left the package with him. When he found out I hadn't been killed in the blast, he killed Earl to keep him from identifying him. Oh, charming. Yep, like an asylum in an earthquake. Well, I told you to stick to redheads. Oh, really? Well, you know any available ones? One. <laughs> How available? Um... You'll have to do some extensive research. Okay. After dinner. I do not do any research on a schedule. Don't you want any dinner? Well, sure. Well, it get cold. Let it. Rick. What? I'm hungry. Oh, for Pete's sake. You sing something while I go put the food on a tray and we can eat in here by the fire. You're going to get fat and sassy. Rick. I take it back. You're already sassy. You sing something. I'll be right back. Nah, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Got to sing for everything. Oh, dee doo 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 That's nice. Just get the food, huh? Just sing, huh? Um, 
I think of you with every breath I take And every breath becomes a sigh Not a sigh of despair But a sign that I care for you I hear your name with every breath I take On every breeze that wanders by And your name is the song I'll remember the long years through Even though I walk alone, you guide me in the darkness, you light my way And all the while inside me Love seems to say Someday, someday And when I sleep, you keep my heart awake But when I wake from dreams divine every breath that I take is a prayer that I'll make you mine Rick hmm? is there really anything to this hypnosis well it sure is the old professor made Simpson open that package is it hard to do Ah, oh, look, I'll show you. Just sit right there. Rick, I... I... It's all right. Just look me right in the eye. All right. You're going to sleep. You're going to sleep. You just want to go to sleep. Nothing makes any difference. Just sleep. 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 Rick? Shh. Deep, deep sleep. A deep... Shower, peaceful. Oh, for Pete's sake. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. To find out how well camels agree with the throats of smokers, this far-reaching test was made. Hundreds of people from coast to coast People with normal throats smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, leading throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers. They made 2,470 examinations and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Try camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and sleep. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels have sent more than 198 million gift camels to our armed forces. This week, gift camels go to hospitalized servicemen and veterans at Veterans Hospitals, Framingham, Massachusetts, and Durban, Michigan, U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California and to all hospitals operated for the U.S. Air Forces in the Far East. Now, until next week, enjoy Camel. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher, and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Gene Bates, Herbert Butterfield, and Tony Michaels. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com.
all adventure fans, calling all Dick Tracy fans. Stand by. Dick Tracy is on the air. Hear the big guns? That's the way they sound when puffed wheat and puffed rice are shot from guns in the Quaker plant. Remember that sound the next time you sit down to a big dish of crisp, crunchy puffed wheat or puffed rice for breakfast. You see, when the nourishing grains of wheat and rice are shot from the big guns, they're actually exploded to eight times their normal size. Each tiny, hard-to-digest food cell is unlocked, and that's why Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are so specially easy to digest, why you get their trigger-fast food energy so quickly and easily. And remember, patrol members, if you want to be strong, healthy, and alert like Dick Tracy is, you need lots of that same kind of food energy. So join the thousands of happy puffed wheat and puffed rice fans who enjoy puffed wheat one day and puffed rice the next. That gives you a delightful taste variety that mother and dad enjoy too. So tell mother about those two swell flavors and ask her to get some Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice at the grocer's for you. And be sure to have your pencil and paper ready for a secret code message from Dick Tracy. Aboard the liner Marvania, bound for America, Dick Tracy and Pat have been trying to protect a certain well-known Egyptologist named Dryden Small from an unknown enemy called the Man with the Yellow Face. Yesterday, we learned how one of the crew in the hold of the ship had been frightened by a strange apparition. Returning from the investigation, Dick overheard the Man with the Yellow Face threatening to kill Pat, whom he had left with Dryden Small. Tracy had no gun with him, so he was forced to try to bluff the man with the yellow face into believing he did have one. Will he succeed? Whoever you are, drop that gun or I'll drop you. Ah, Mr. Tracy. Uh, come in, won't you? I've got you covered, so don't try anything. Put down that gun. Thank you. No. This little pearl-handled revolver belongs to Dryden Small. A dangerous little toy, but rather attractive. So I prefer to keep it. Who are you? What's your name? I believe I have been called the man with a yellow face. Rather an unpleasant, distressing name. I don't like it. My real name, and I hope that you will use it henceforward, gentlemen, is Kumi Batik. Egyptian, huh? That is right. Dick, he wounded Dryden Small. He knifed him before I could get in here. I heard Small cry out. It was in self-defense. You see, Mr. Tracy, he was indiscreet enough to withhold something from me. Something I wanted very badly. The Black Pearl of Osiris. Ah, you know. You wounded Small because he wouldn't tell you where it was. What is the Black Pearl of Osiris? And why have you been following Small to get it? That gun you are holding in your pocket, if you actually are holding a gun there, Mr. Tracy, compels me to answer more or less. As I have said, my name is Humi Batik. I am the high priest of the cult of Osiris, a secret group dedicated to the worship of that ancient god. And what about the Black Pearl? Has it some religious significance? Ah, it has indeed. The Black Pearl is a very small pearl. But as you know, Black Pearls are rare and therefore are of considerable value. Aside from its value in money, however, the Black Pearl of Osiris is priceless in our eyes, for it is really the heart of Osiris. How can a pearl black or white be anybody's heart? Oh, you interpret my remark too literally, Mr. Patton. Many, many hundreds of years ago, a statue of Osiris was molded from gold with eyes of diamonds. When it was erected, it was decided that the statue must have a heart and it must be something unusual, something worthy of that incredibly beautiful statue. Tutankhamal, the pharaoh of that time, had in his possession a small but perfect black pearl, and he gave this to the temple to be used as the heart of Osiris. I'm beginning to understand. That statue wasn't by any chance placed in Tutankhamal's tomb when he died, was it? Mr. Tracy, I bow to you. Yes, the statue was placed there. For hundreds of years, it was safe. Then came this infidel and stole the black pearl. But we knew, we who have guarded it for centuries, we knew that the heart of Osiris had been taken and that it must be returned at all costs. I have found it necessary to employ force, a thing I detest. But in my heart, 
I know that Osiris will forgive me, for I did it for him. Well, that's Osiris' will, Batik. But undoubtedly you're aware of the fact that there is another law here on Earth which meets out its own justice. And so... No, no, no. Do not move toward me, I caution you. Believe me, I will gladly give myself over to you after I have returned the pearl. But I have not the black pearl. Un... Until I do have it, you cannot have me. I'm afraid you're mistaken about that. Believe me, I sympathize with you, but... It is not your sympathy I want. It is the black pearl of Osiris. That is what I want, and that is what I will have. Put down that gun, Batik. You cannot frighten me. I am not sure whether you have a gun there in your pocket or not. But if you have, you had better begin firing it now, because... Look out, sir. He's aiming at the light. Guard that door, Captain. Right the door, Captain. Don't let him get out. Go. Oh. Dick, you're hurt. You're hurt. Don't move. Don't out of my way, Captain. Or I will... Oh. Oh. After him, for heaven's sake, fight. don't let him get away. Oh. Oh, my leg, I can't stand on it. Go after him. Don't let him get away. Yes, and by the Lord Harry Tracy, I'll have the whole crew out to look for him. Does that hurt, Mr. Tracy? A little, Doctor, not much. Not much, huh? I admire your nerves, sir, but you can't tell me that you aren't experiencing intense pain. I've probed for bullets before. Well, you, you have to get it out, don't you? Yes, but I'm not so sure that I can that fire of yours ought to be x-rayed to find out the exact location of the bullet. The bullet must be a very small one to judge from the wound. Yeah, it was a very small revolver. A small pearl handle, one belonging to Dryden Small. Ah, yes, Mr. Small. I treated him for a few knife wounds an hour ago. He'll be laid up for a long time. Tracy, I don't like that man. He deserved everything he got. Ah, that hurt you, didn't it? No, no, it's like they gone. Yeah. The crew are searching for Hui Batik, are they, Pat? Yeah, every available man. They'll find him, too. I wonder. It's clever, that Egyptian. They've searched for him before and couldn't find him. That's all right. All right, Doctor. Pat, I'm afraid our Egyptian friend is clever enough to find a safe place to hide. I wish I could be out with a crew hunting for him. What about that black pearl, Dick? The Egyptian seems sure dried and small had it. Have you any idea where it might be? No, Pat, I haven't. I can't help thinking that if only I'd known about this before... Right and small, it told me the whole story. All this might have been avoided. That would have meant telling you that he stole the pearl of Osiris. Yeah. You always suspected him, didn't you? Well, I thought he was dishonest and evasive, but I didn't know anything definite. Mr. Tracy. Yes, sir? I'm not going to probe for that bullet anymore. It's useless. Oh? You have to wait until we dock tomorrow, go to a doctor immediately, and have it x-rayed. Unfortunately, we have no facilities for x-ray on board. I see. All right, Doctor, I'll do that. Now, I'll bandage it up. I think you'll be able to get around. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks very much. No luck as yet, Captain? Oh, none, Tracy, none. My men are searching the boat, but there doesn't seem to be much chance of finding Mr. Batik. As you say, he's probably chosen the one place where we wouldn't think of looking. Yes. The one place where we wouldn't think of looking. I wonder what that might be. Well, if I knew, I could save the crew a lot of trouble. But I can promise you this, Tracy. He won't get off the boat when we dock tomorrow without being caught. I'll see to that. Yes? I wonder, Captain. I wonder. I've been watching the passengers go down the gangplank, Dick. And so far, I haven't seen anyone resembling Batik. No, neither have I, Pat. But he's going to try to get off this boat. You can depend on that. We have every gangplank guarded. Hey, Dick! Junior! Well, old man, I'm glad to see you. Oh, gosh, am I glad to see you, Dick. Oh, hello, Pat. Oh, thanks. Oh, Pat. <laughs> That's okay, kid. I know when Dick's around, no one else exists. <laughs> Tell me, Junior, how's the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol going? We got lots of members? Boy, I'll say we have. Hey, what are you looking for? Oh, um, a friend of ours, Junior. He thought he might be getting off the boat. Uh, some gangster, I'll bet. Wrong that time, youngster. See anyone, Pat? No, I just thought for a minute. But it isn't him. Say, hey, who are you looking for, anyway? An Egyptian named Humi Batik. He's been hiding on boat. Wounded a man. He says he did it in self-defense. We've got to get him. Dick, are you limping? Well, he was shot, Junior. Shot by the Egyptian, huh? Yeah. Say, Dick, is it bad? No, no, no. It's all right, Junior. Oh, Captain. Hello there, Tracy. Any luck? No, none as yet. Well, I hope he hasn't got past us. But I don't see how he could. I've got men stationed all over the place. Homie Batik isn't hard to recognize with that yellow face of his. 
There are two things that puzzle me, Captain. Hmm? Where is Fumi Bartik hiding, and where is the Black Pearl? I searched the small effect thoroughly and couldn't find it. Well, I'd give a good deal to know the answer to those questions myself. Say, Dick, isn't that a body they're bringing off now? Down by the hole there. Now, now that isn't a body, Junior. That's a mummy case containing a mummy which belonged to the guy who was wounded. A mummy? Oh, gosh. What would be the one place we'd never think of looking? Uh, uh, what was that, Tracy? Captain, I may be crazy, but come on. Dick, where are you going? I'm going to down to have a look at that mummy. But, Dick, you don't actually think he'd be in there, do you? I don't know, Pat. The one place we haven't looked for him. The one place no one would think of looking for him. By heavens, Tracy, I believe you're right. We'll soon know. Here, you. Yeah? Put that mummy case down, will you? Yeah, with pleasure. Boy, they sure built these things in the old days. Weighs a ton. All right, boys, put it down. Okay, okay, there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. There we are. Well, I must say, Tracy, you set me off thorough. Got to hand it to you. I would never have thought of looking in that mummy case. Well, Rue, we're not sure he's in there. He may not be, you know. Yeah, there's something to that. But I have a hunch, Pat. A hunch that he is. All right, boys, pry off that lid. Okay. 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 Draw your gun, Pat, and stand ready. Right, Dick. You may need it. Is Humi Batik concealed in the mummy case? And supposing he is, where is the black pearl? A big surprise awaits us, a surprise you won't want to miss for anything. And now stand by for a meeting of the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. Brought to you by the makers of Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. Those two nourishing, tasty cereals that are shot from guns. Here's Dick Tracy Jr., your president now. The meeting will now come to order. And today we have another secret code message for you from Dick Tracy. Have you got your pencil and paper ready to take it down? If not... Get them right now so you won't miss Dick's secret message. While you're getting your pencil and paper, I want to report a lot of new promotions to the ranks of sergeant and lieutenant. Congratulations, officers of the Dick Tracy Secret Service Patrol. And if you aren't an officer already, start to win your promotion right away. It tells you how in your secret code book. All right, Mr. Quaker Man. Here's the secret code message. You ready, everyone? It's prisoner 20 6 10 16. Three, twenty-one, seventeen, sixteen, twenty, eight, sixteen, three, eight, eighteen, fifteen, four, twelve, twenty-one, fifteen, thirteen, nine, fourteen. That's a long one, Junior. I think you'd better repeat it. Okay. Here it is again. It's prisoner. Twenty, six, ten, sixteen, three, twenty-one, seventeen, sixteen, twenty, eight, sixteen, three, eight, eighteen, fifteen, four, twelve. You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo. Pull up at the end of the street, Roger. Yes, but Martha, we haven't much time. Please, do as I say. I want to ask. Very well, Miss. Anything to say. Kiss me, Roger. Of course, my love. You have but do No, but I want to know if you love me. Oh, you know I do, darling. You never leave me. Never, never. It was at this point that Martha opened her bag and withdrew a pearl-handled revolver. You promise? I promise. Oh, what a pity. <laughs> Sir Rodney Kellogg slid away from her, an expression of utter amazement on his face as he collapsed across the steering wheel, dead. The Avengers. John Steed 
and Emma Peel, The Avengers. John Steed thinks Emma Peel might be right in suggesting the top men in the ministry are being persuaded to forget their jobs in order to... Love or... In investigating a security leak at the Missile Redeployment Department, John Steed and Emma Peel had become aware of a curious atmosphere of unreality. Sir Rodney Kellogg's behavior had been extraordinary, to say the least of it. When interviewed by Steed, he appeared to answer all questions as though in a trance. Later, he'd made a particularly daring escape from the building where he was held under close arrest. No one had been able to trace him. It wasn't until the next morning that John Steed's telephone rang. Steed? Steed did see to it. He and Mrs. Peel were in the mews in record time. Hmm. Nasty. then. Poor old Sir Rodney. This is one murder he can't accept responsibility for. No sign of the weapon. Mm -mm, not this time. More bullet hole. Could be another pearl-handled revolver. Could be. What he was doing around here? Eloping? Oh, now, Mrs. Peel, don't start all that again. Take my word for it, Steve. In a case like this, he's just... Hmm. Chez La Femme. What's that? Perfume. Very, very exclusive. Ah, a clue at last. Mrs. Peel picked up a wisp of handkerchief from the floor. A lady's handkerchief and beautifully perfumed. Hmm. Well, that's your territory, Mrs. Peel. Think you can identify it? Of course. It's reckless abandon. Sounds highly appropriate. Who makes it? A company called Bell Chamber Brothers. Well, that's your next call, then, Mrs. Peel. Bell Chamber Brothers, perfumier's extraordinary, was so exclusive, Mrs. Peel had to positively hunt out their premises. The shop was old-fashioned, but tastefully decorated. Mrs. Peel entered and made her way between the bowls of roses and lavender water, not noticing the tall blonde who was inspecting some scent in a display cabinet. An immaculately groomed, languid young man glided forward. Oh, madam, and what can I do for you? I'd like to speak to Mr. Bellchamber. Oh, that's my brother. He's away in Provence at the moment, crushing Lily. Really? I'm surprised he doesn't object. <laughs> I was about to say crushing lilies for Lily of the Valley, madam. James always pops over at this time of year. But if he's your brother, why isn't your name Bell Chamber? Oh, but it is, madam. Oh, but then how did you know I didn't want to speak to you? Nobody ever does, madam. I've got no personality, you see. None at all? Not one iota. My brother says that as a salesman, I'm a total disaster. When he's here, he shuts me up in the back of the shop like Cinderella. Really? Well, you know how she ended up, don't you? How? She lived happily ever after. After what? 
Uh, oh, yes, yes, I see what you mean. Thank you very much for the encouragement. And how can I be of service? Well, you can tell me something. Certainly. It's reckless abandon. Is it a popular line? With the discerning and the wealthy, it's priced a little high for most pockets. So the number of clients who use it would be, um... Ten, fifteen, twenty of the most. Mm-hmm. Could you give me a list of their names? Oh, well, that's a little irregular, madam. Ah, but you see, I'm writing an article on perfumes of the aristocracy. I take it you wouldn't be adverse to a little publicity. Oh, as long as it's discreet, madam. Very well. Please take a seat. Bell chamber disappeared. Mrs. Peel settled down to wait, watched by the tall blonde, who was Martha, the charlady. Here we are, madam. As far as I can tell from our records, this is a complete list. I'm very grateful. Um... Perhaps you'd care to put your gratitude into more tangible form, madam? The show told our latest end. What? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, here's my card. Send me a taste of Lily of the Valley, distilled by your brother, of course. Ah, yes, madam, of course. Thank you very much. Mrs. Peel left the shop. Martha moved forward, swiftly picked up Mrs. Peel's card and hurried out. Just a minute, madam. You've forgotten your bottle of... Oh, reckless abandon. Down in the street, Martha rushed through the traffic to a parked sports car, opening the door and flinging herself into it alongside the driver. Get off that girl, the one over there. Why? Why, for heaven's sake, Martha? The list with my name on it. That's sin, Martha. Yes, but I've got her address. Then don't worry, my darling. I'll phone Freeman. He'll handle it for us. Don't worry. He never fails. While Mrs. Peel was tracing one cent, John Steed was following up on clues at the Ministry of Missile Redeployment, interviewing Sir Rodney's second-in-command, Horatio Tate. A woman? You say that Sir Rodney was killed by a woman? It looks like it, Mr. Tate. Did you ever see him with one? Never. He avoided them like the plague. I can't say I blame him, Dreddy. Extraordinary creatures, women. You never understand what makes them tick. And Sir Rodney felt the same way? They were anathema, Steed. Sheer anathema. Mentioned women's lib and he'd go purple in the face. Perhaps he was having an unhappy love affair. Oh, impossible. There's no room for that kind of thing in our line of country. We lead a very monastic life here, you understand. We can't allow ourselves to be distracted by men... <laughs> Mr. Tite, the commission's report. If you just put it against your name when you've read it and pass it on to the next one. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, put it on the desk. Please. All right, thank you. Uh, you were saying? Uh, yeah, I was saying that uh, what you're suggesting is out of the question, Steed. If Sir Rodney had been uh, carrying on, as they say, I, I would certainly have known about it. I see. Well, then I'm sorry to have wasted your time. Uh, not at all. Glad to uh, scotch the rumor before it spreads. Mm. De Mortuis Nil Nisi Burnham. But, uh, yes, quite, exactly. Steed left, Tate frowned. De Mortuis Nil Nisi. Well, In the nearby office, Roxby, a fellow worker, picked up his phone. Roxby. Roxby, Tate, sir. Look, I just had a fellow in my office suggesting that Sir Rodney was playing about with some woman here in the office. <laughs> well, goodness gracious, whatever next? Well, the chaps in the club will have a good laugh about that. In uh, his office, you say? Well, <laughs> miracles never cease. But uh, pigs will fly before we see any of that sort of thing in this department. <laughs> Roxby was still chuckling as he replaced the telephone and turned to gaze affectionately at the woman next to him. It was Martha. Back in her char lady gear. Darling. I've got to go now, darling. Oh, so soon, my puppet. Oh, I can't hang around here all day. I've got work to do. Uh, <laughs> oh, when shall I see you again? My, uh, um, um, mm, you've got something to tell me. Oh, well, my heart is filled with things to tell you, my treasure. Mm, not those sort of things. I mean, important things. The things I ask you to find out for me. And you promise. Oh, I know, and I know. I keep my promise. Oh, but how will I find you, darling? You won't have to, Basil. I'll find you. <laughs> Bye now. With that, Martha picked up her skirt and her bucket and left. <laughs> Mrs. P. 
Peel in her apartment, having studied the list she'd obtained from Bell Chamber Broth, was consulting Mother on the telephone. I want to eliminate some of the names on the list first, Mother. Tell me about Lady Vanessa Cholmodley Davenport. Nothing to tell about her, except she's dead. Had a drink last Tuesday. Oh. Mrs. Maud Kingsley Ravenshoe? Forget her. Uh, since she came out in 38. The Honorable Malvina Harcourt-Smith? Cross her out. She's a platoon commander and a girl guide. Remember that ghastly scandal when she pitched up a car with three brownies? Oh. Well, the Duchess of... Oh, hold on, Mother. There's someone at the front door. Mrs. Peel, still holding the list, put down the phone and went to the front door. A man stood in the doorway, a snub-nosed gun pointing straight at her. The list. That's what I've come for. Yeah, that perfume list. Smells of danger to me, Mrs. Peel. a new way to fight tooth decay for Keeps. New fluoride for Keeps toothpaste. It's the clear blue way to fight tooth decay, and it's the best anti-decay toothpaste around. New great tasting for Keeps toothpaste. The clear blue way to fight tooth decay for Keeps. Great teeth are forever. Great teeth are for Keeps. New family fluoride for Keeps toothpaste. The cleaning power of cold water Omo gives you the superb cleanness you want from a washing powder. Listen to Mrs. Baxter of Claremont. It really is good. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, really, that, that it could be so good. You know. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Have you heard the strange tales of The Whistler? I know John Blake isn't here. I know because he's disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. Another Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales. Many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the amazing story of the penalty. Young Alan Harper stands at the window of his small office and stares gloomily out over the city as the lights flicker on in the dusk. Alan has trouble. Perhaps he should have kept his job as a private detective. Perhaps he shouldn't have taken the law course. 
for he hasn't had a single client since the day he passed the bar examination. Better to give up and go back to the detective agency. Then the door opens and the figure steps into the dimly lighted room. Are uh, you the attorney? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm Alan Harper. I, uh, I have a little business for you. Business? Oh, what kind of business? I want you to draw a will and, uh, later deliver a letter for me. A will? Oh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, do you know who I am? Well, I, I've certainly seen you before, but I, I just can't place you. I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I've seen your picture many times. Yes. But, uh, why have you come to me? You have a staff of the best attorneys in town. I know, but because of the, you know, the peculiar nature of the business at hand, I prefer an unknown, a, a lawyer who had no previous interest in me or my affairs. I see. And also one who was not doing any too well. Well, I'll have to admit that you picked a good example. In a few moments, you'll have guessed what I have in mind. You'll know why I can't have my own attorneys handle this. Why not? You have no personal interest in me, Harper. This is a cold business proposition, and I'll make it worth your while. Yes. When I walk out of here, I want you to forget the whole thing for a few days. Agreed? Very well. Then take down what I say, and I'll sign it. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I leave all my property, personal and real, including the painting of her mother, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments of this nature previously drawn. Yes. That's all. Oh. Yes. I'll sign it now. Now, uh, uh, here is a letter addressed to my brother, Hillary, in this city. He's recently returned after 25 years in Australia. Though he has written me several times lately, we've been estranged all these years over a situation which this letter will clear up. Very well, Mr. Blake, but, um, but just what... Uh, uh, no questions, Mr. Harper, please. I, I want you to keep the will and letter. You'll know what to do with them when the time arrives. Are you... I mean... Mr. Blake, are you afraid of being murdered? No, Harper, there was a time. Oh, but not now. Sounds a little crazy to me. Here you are, young man. Your fee. What? what? A thousand dollars. Oh, but that's most unusual. Why Why all that? I'm paying you that much because I know you need it badly, and your need will make you keep our agreement that you'll forget all this for a few days and say nothing to anyone. You're planning to commit suicide, Mr. Blake. And what if I were? Then it's my duty to stop you. What would my death matter to you? People die every day, commit suicide, or murder. It means nothing to you. Yes, but this is different. Mr. Harper, I'm not planning to commit suicide. You're sure? Yes, I assure you. So if you don't care to go through with the agreement, I, I'll take the money back and find someone else. No. No, I believe you, Mr. Blake. I'll keep the agreement. I, I've got to. Very well. Goodbye, Harper, and good luck. Goodbye, Mr. Blake. Young Alan Harper sits pondering over the strange event. The will, the letter. He drops the role of attorney... And his mind works from the angle of the detective. What a strange situation. Another day has passed. And toward noon, Anita Blake talks to her fiancé, Wilbur Martin. I'm sorry to call you out here, Wilbur, but I just had to talk to you. What is it, Anita? What's wrong? It's about father. Your father? He left the office late yesterday afternoon, but he didn't come home. Well, maybe he went to his club. No, Wilbur. I mean, he didn't come home at all. He still hasn't come. I called his club. I called every place. Oh, Wilbur, I'm terribly worried. Why? Well, Father's been acting strangely of late. He, he's so morose. I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? I'm afraid something's happened to him. Anita, maybe... Maybe he's been kidnapped. Wilbur, kidnapped? But, but if that had happened, wouldn't someone contact us by this time? Well, maybe not. Have you called every place that he might be? Oh, yes. Have you called the police? No, I wanted to wait till I talked to you. Have you called his brother, Hillary? No, I haven't, but I don't think he'd be there. You know about that situation. They haven't been on good terms for years and years. They've only seen each other once since Uncle Hillary came back from Australia. Yes, I know. 
He's a strange sort of person, that Hillary. I've only seen him once the time I went to his apartment with you, but he's certainly strange. I know, but perhaps that's only natural. What was it that caused them to become so bitter towards each other? I really don't know. Father never told me. But I think it had something to do with a girl they were both in love with. Uh, Did your father know Hillary was coming back to the States? Of course. Hillary wrote him several times, but father didn't answer him. Is your uncle Hillary well fixed? Certainly. He became wealthy in Australia. What are you trying to say? Are you sure he made money over there? Of course. Father told me that many times. Well, your father could have been misled about Hillary being well off. Well, but I don't know what you mean. I think Uncle Hillary is all right. I rather like him. And I don't care what the differences were between them. Are you inferring that Uncle Hillary... No, I'm not inferring anything. I'm just asking. Uh, why not call Hillary and ask him to come over here? All right. Don't tell him about your father. Just just ask him to come over here as soon as possible. You're all wrong about this, Wilbur. I know now what you're thinking. But I'm sure you're wrong. You call him, Anita. And let him think your father is here. Then, after we talk to him, we can call the police. Wilbur is very clever. He may be right about Hillary. Maybe Hillary knows something about his brother's strange disappearance. But then, Hillary is clever, too. Quite clever. A half hour later, Hillary arrives. What on earth is this all about? I'm awfully glad you could come so soon, Uncle Hillary. Is John Neely? Oh, uh, you remember Wilbur Martin, Uncle, my fiancé. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, What's wrong with you two? What's happened? Uh, Mr. Blake, uh, how long since you've seen your brother? It's been about uh, four or five months, shortly after I came here from Australia. Wilbur, I... Would you like to have a few words with him? Why, certainly. What's happened? Wilbur, stop this nonsense. Uncle Hillary, father is... Well, he isn't here. He's disappeared. What? Disappeared? Yes, and Wilbur thought maybe you knew where he was. Oh, I see. Well, Wilbur, I don't know. Uh, I know that now, but... Well, I just wanted to make sure. Oh, don't let your imagination run away with you, Wilbur. Father didn't come home last night from the office, and I've called every place. Every place. Well, uh, what do you think's become of him? Well, he's been acting very strangely. I'm afraid that he... He's committed suicide. Suicide? But Wilbur thinks that somebody may have kidnapped him for ransom. We could both be right. He could have been murdered. I suggest that you call the police at once and check the hospital, the morgue, every place. Yes, yes, of course. You call them, Wilbur, please. I can't. Yes, you're calling. Now I'll attend to it. Wilbur calls the police and the hospital, and the morgue. But he learns nothing of value. Two days pass by, and still not a sign of John Blake or his body. Then Alan Hopper, the attorney, visits the John Blake home. Come in, Mr. Hopper. Thank you, Miss Blake. This is my fiancé, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin? What is it, Mr. Hopper? Is uh, your father here, Miss Blake? My father? What? Why, no. Well, what did you want to see him about, Hopper? Why, I wanted to see him on some uh, personal business. Mm, well, why don't you try to find him at his office? I did, but he isn't there. He hasn't been there for several days. Just what is your business, Mr. Hopper? Or why do you want to see Mr. Blake? I don't want to see Mr. Blake. Because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. What do you want, Mr. Hopper? Who are you? I'm a detective. Detective? Yes. Go on, Mr. Hopper. I know John Blake isn't here. I know because he's disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We call the police. We ask them to keep it quiet. Yes, yes, I know that. But I'm I'm working in the background. Well, if you don't think he's here, then where do you think he is? I think he's dead. Dead? Why do you think that? Just what do you know, Mr. Harper? I wanted to talk to you and... Mr. Blake. What? Uh, and who is this? Mr. Blake. Well, sir. You, I... uh, you seem startled, young man. What's wrong? Oh, well, yes, I am, sir. I, I, I thought what that... What did you think? Well, I, I thought you were dead, sir. That is... He's well... a detective. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Blake, but... Well, I guess curiosity got the better of me. What are you talking about? Well, you remember. The agreement. What agreement? Wait a minute. Do you know who you're talking to? Yes, yes, of course. John Blake. No, Mr. Harper. This is my uncle, my father's brother, Hillary. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. Twin? 
John and Hillary were twins. Of course. Well, I didn't know that. Then apparently you know my father, John Blake. Yeah. What did you know about him? You know where he is? Well, I... Excuse me just a moment. I, I've never been so startled in all my life. Yes. Yes, now that I look at him, now that I recall his speech, there's a difference. And why do you think John Blake is dead, Mr. Hall? I've just come from police headquarters. You, you mean he's been murdered? No. No, not murdered. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Are you sure? Oh, <laughs> I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and coat and overcoat were found on the river docks. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made the day before yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. <laughs> there was a will, you say? Yes. Could you identify the uh, hat and coat, Miss Blake? Of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Do you uh, recognize this coat and hat, Miss Blake? Yes. Yes, I do, then. They were fathers. Oh, Wilbur. Sure, Sidra. I, I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. Well, what about the will found in the pocket? Uh, show them the will, Sergeant. You read it, Wilbur. Yes, of course. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I leave all my property, personal and real, including the painting of her mother, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments of this nature previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. That's the original. And signed. Where did you get this, Harper? Look at the signature of the witness. Alan Harper. You witnessed the signature? I did. And how do you explain that, Mr. Harper? Because I typed the will for John Blake the night he disappeared. He signed it, and I witnessed the signature. But why should he come to you, a detective? It's true that I'm a detective, but I'm also an attorney at law. But Mr. Blake has his own attorney. Nevertheless, he came to me to draw this will. And if I hadn't recognized him from his pictures, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. You recognize your father's signature, Anita? Yes. Yes, it is all right. I still can't understand the reason for his doing such a thing. He did everything in the world, everything to live for, money, position, he... He must have been out of his mind. Well, I'll admit he did act very strangely, but he seemed to be rational enough. But this still isn't proof that he's dead. There's no body, no proof that he committed suicide. The body may not be found for days, but this evidence at hand certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Harper. It's possible they could have... Uh, what were you going to say? Uh, nothing. Miss Blake. In a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? While he was dictating the will, I had a premonition that he was planning to kill himself. When I confronted him with my suspicion, he was able to convince me that he had no such intention. It's obvious now why he came to me. Why? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But why did he make this new will if he'd already made one? Yes, uh, that's what I'd like to know. Well, I'm still not convinced that he committed suicide. No? Well, maybe this will help. Here's a letter he asked me to, to uh, deliver to Hillary Blake. A letter? To me? Yes. He said it would clear up a few things. Huh. Well. Well, what does it say, Uncle? Well, it, uh, it says several things. Things he'd never have said unless he were going to die. Suppose you read it, Wilbur. Yes. Hillary... For 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed over there in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia, that she was rightfully yours. But I loved her too, and I couldn't go on without her. I know you despised us both all these years, and I pretended to despise you. I had to pretend because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to a woman in Australia. Marcia is innocent. I was to blame. When Marcia died last year, you wrote that you were coming back. I knew that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you. And I've kept away from you because I just couldn't face it. I told you all this because things have happened, which you will learn soon enough, that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, 
I beg of you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, John. Well, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we just have to wait. Yes. For that and the body. Everyone seems to be convinced that John Blake has committed suicide. That is, everyone except Wilbur Martin. But still, the body has not been found. Then, one morning, four days later, Alan Harper calls Anita and Hillary to police headquarters. Morning, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake. What is it, Mr. Harper? Uh, have, uh, have you found John? I hope you don't mind my coming along, Mr. Harper. No. No, not at all, Mr. Martin. What's happened? They found a body this morning on the rocks at the mouth of the river. It's rather badly bruised and cut. And, well, it's in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, what? I know I... how you feel, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. May I come too? Please do, Wilbur. This way, please. Here we are. Wilbur. Oh. What do you say, Miss Blake? Oh, it's awful. Now, now, get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. <laughs> And you, Mr. Blake? Well, it's certainly hard to say. It looks like it might be John, but was there no means of identification on this body? No jewelry? His father or... never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pocket. Oh, well, but that's his father's suit, all right. His father, I know. But why? Why did he do it? Come along, Mr. Blake. You needn't stay here any longer. <laughs> no, no, darling. Oh. Well, I... Still can't understand. I'd like to have a word with you, Martin. Yes? Oh, all right. Oh, uh, would you and your uncle uh, wait here for a moment? Of course. Uh, this way, Martin. All right, Martin. Why did you phone me? I wanted permission to see the body. Do you think it was John Blake? Oh, I can't tell, but well, they certainly should know. Wilbur, from the start, you've been skeptical about the suicide theory. Why? Why? Well, I, uh... Who were you trying to frame? You're crazy. I'm not trying to frame anybody. You think he was murdered? Yes, I do. But not by you, of course. Oh, certainly not. But how do you account for the fact that John came to my office, signed the will he dictated, and gave me the letter to Hillary? He must have contemplated suicide. Are you sure it was John Blake who made the will? You think it was Hillary? It could have been. But John's temples were quite gray, and he had no trace of an accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent and grayed his temples. Go on. He could have gotten hold of John's clothes and hat. And after he left you, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river and left the evidence of the riverfront. And uh, why would Hillary kill John? Well, uh, well, there have been several reasons. Maybe maybe because of Marcia. Maybe, well, several reasons. Did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No. Why should he? Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting on the will and the letter to Hillary. She identified the body, but you keep harping about murder. Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You'd better be careful, Wilbur. If you're trying to make a murder out of this, you may hang yourself. What? How? False accusation. I've still got the will and the letter to Hillary. I checked with papers at John's office. The writing is the same. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Well, then how can you tell unless you had a sample of Hillary's writing? I think it. you have a sample of Hillary's writing. You found the letters from Hillary to John? Yes. Found a packet of them. It's on his desk. Good. Good. That will be what I was waiting for. Well, there they are. Several of them tied together. Now, I'll tell you something. I never thought John committed suicide. I think he was murdered. You... You do? Yes. And uh, before you go, Wilbur, I'd like to have a sample of your handwriting here on this pad. Very well. Thank you, Wilbur. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, Sergeant, have you finished checking? Yes, Harper, I've finished. And uh, what's the verdict? Well, this is the cleverest bit of forgery I've ever come across. This would have passed any place if the question hadn't come up. So? This will and the letter to Hillary would certainly get by anyone as having been written by John Blake. Yes. 
When comparing the suicide letter from John to Hillary with this letter Hillary wrote from Australia, we notice a difference but a basic similarity. Would the fact that they're twins be the reason for that? No, on closer examination we find characteristics which couldn't appear in both letters if they were twins. Then you agree with me that Hillary must have written the suicide letter and signed the will. I certainly do. It's a tough thing to prove. I think you're on the right track, but, well, I... All I can do is bluff it through, eh? I'm afraid you'll have to work on forcing a confession in this case. Did you, uh... Did you check all these letters from Hillary? No, just those on top. Well, I'd appreciate it if you checked them all. Well, just as you say. Now, what about young Wilbur Martin? Well, so far I can't see much in him to worry about. But then you never can tell. I think Hillary's the man, all right. I thought that for some time. But I'll just phone out to the house and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing, and if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone when I get there. He can be picked up later. Okay, I'll check the rest of Hillary's letter. Go ahead. I won't phone out there till you finish. Ten minutes later, a startling piece of news breaks. The headlines are screamed by newsboys. Extras flood the streets. And Wilbur Martin rushes to the Blake home and faces Anita and Hillary Blake. What is it, Wilbur? What's wrong with you? Yes, for heaven's sake, what's happened? You haven't heard? You, you don't know, Anita? No, what do you mean? Well, look. Look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. Wilbur. Wilbur, what does it mean? I'll tell you. John Blake embezzled the company funds and they've gone to the wall. What? Yes, close the door. Oh, Wilbur, no, I can't believe such... I'm sorry, Anita. There it is, in black and white. Then that's the motive for his suicide. Why? Why? Because he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to cover up the shortage. I don't think he lost. You don't? No. Nonsense. He must have. Why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, no. Please, Anita. Uh, you mustn't worry. Oh, I, I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico till this blows over. Huh? You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her any place. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. Do you want to go to Mexico with a murderer? What? Your father may have built the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid it. And your Uncle Hillary found out where he hid it, and he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Crazy. Out of your mind. This doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. You're a fool. Pack your things in here. I'll uh, phone the airport for reservation. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. They're on the way here now. I just talk to that detective, Mr. Harper. They've proved that you wrote the John's will and the suicide letter. You killed John and you have the money. Wilbur, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out here. Get out. Get out! No, I won't leave. No one will leave till they come. Well, you got here just in time, Mr. Harper. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? Yes, he knows everything. I just told him about the handwriting discovery. John Blake stole the money from the loan company. Hillary here found out about it and learned where it was hidden and killed John. He's talking nonsense. Mr. Blake, Sergeant Evans here is the police uh, handwriting expert. He's examined the will and the suicide letter from John. He's also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. What? And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, the same characteristics which appear in the will and the suicide letter. You wrote the suicide letter? Definitely. And we can get a conviction on it. Ridiculous. But uh, there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Uh, where's that painting? Well, there it is on the wall. Just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. You're tearing off the back. Yes. Yes. And there you are. There's the reason why. Bonds. Thousands in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He did kill John for all this. I did no such thing. No. No, that's right. You didn't kill John Blake. Well, the... then who did? Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John. What are the dates? The... September and, and November 1940. Those were Hillary's last letters to John. Now look at these. June and July 1920. You notice any difference? Well, all are signed by Hillary. But the, the ones dated 1920 are not at all like the ones written in 1940. Not the least similarity. 
We just discovered these old letters. The ones dated 1920 were written by Hillary. But the ones dated 1940 were written by John. John? What do you mean? You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? And you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. Oh, but what are you saying? At first, we overlooked the earlier letters of Hillary Blake. But when we saw them, we knew we, they were not the same hand. We knew John forged the recent one. Furthermore, I, uh, I checked with Australia. Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. This man is John Blake, posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Nita, you... you... And Nita knew all about it. She's in on the plan. Oh, it was a clever one. And they might have gotten away with the phony suicide, but uh, he picked the wrong attorney. Oh, uh, here's your thousand dollars, Blake. But I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Well, that's the story. John had gone to great lengths in laying his plan, but he made a mistake by failing to destroy the early letters from Hillary, and he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. John had covered every point. He had even established residence in an apartment as Hillary, had used the story of estrangement as an excuse for not associating with Hillary. And what of the body in the morgue? That's where they slipped again. The police knew the identity of the body. That was merely a trap laid by Alan Harper. Anita was too quick in identifying the first body she saw, too anxious. It was obviously not her father. But the finding of an unidentified body seemed so convenient that she jumped at the chance to declare it was John Blake. Yes, there's many a slip, Twix. But you know the rest. <laughs> has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time, I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual story. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G A R, brought to you by G3PL.com. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gene Paul King, pinch hitting for his sick pal, Ken Roberts, and telling you that The Shadow starts his adventure in just a moment. But first, are you starting off the right way these cold winter mornings? Does your furnace send up quick heat the moment you open the drafts? It will if you burn blue coal. What's more, with Blue Coal, you'll have a truly comfortable, well-heated home all day long. So next time you order fuel, be sure to ask for Blue Coal. You can get Blue Coal and free information on low-cost home heating from your neighborhood Blue Coal dealer. Give him a call first thing in the morning. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the Shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible Shadow belongs. Today's story, The Ghost Building. <laughs> Jerome Need speaking. 
Yes? Yes, we just completed purchase of the ground this morning. That's right. And in your story, you can say that the building we intend to erect will be the largest and finest in the world. We're calling it the Coast Building. That's right. Not at all. Goodbye. Oh, Miss Carlson, I... Wait, who are you? What are you doing in here? No, no, Mr. Nee, don't get excited. Who are you? You're the head of the construction company of this proposed new coast building, are you not? That's right. Now, look, if you're a reporter, I've already given the story I'm not to... a reporter. I've come here to warn you not to erect that building. Now, listen, if this is a prank, it's some pretty poor taste. This is not a prank. It's simply a forecast of death and torture if the present plans go through. I don't know who you are, nor do I take any stock in your forecast. I'm sorry, but you're wrong on both counts. My forecast will, must come true. And you do know me. Oh, from where? From the past. It's slight wonder that you don't recognize me after all this time. But one day, Jerome Need, you will remember me all too well. You'll pay me back in full all that you owe me. yourself. You almost missed that rivet. Oh, I, I was just thinking. You ain't supposed to think. You're supposed to catch oh, rivets. Oh, that's what I was thinking. Years from now, when my kid says to me, Pop, what did you have to do with putting up that largest bill in the world? And you'll say what? I'll say, a guy threw a rivet, and I caught the rivet. Then a guy threw a rivet, and I caught the rivet. Then a guy threw a rivet. Catch that when it's coming now. Oh, I, I didn't see. Hey, look out. Don't lean over like that. Mike, look out. Oh. Watch out above, we're swinging the girder in. Hey, boss, look yeah. at that lad up there. His back is turned, you don't see the girder. Stop that frame, Frick! Look out up there! Watch it, boss! Look out up! It hit him! It hit him, uh, boss! He's falling! Too many die in that squat. Too many die on this job. Hey, you got to take chances in this business, Not Joe. Not me, I don't. Too many dead men on the foundation of this building now. I got honor and the kids to think about. Nah, you're talking screwy. We'll safer up here than them guys out on the street. <laughs> Besides, Anna and them kids got to eat, don't they? Sure, don't worry. I feed them, but not from this job. I'm going below and quit now. This cost building is jinxed. Okay. Good luck, Joe. Yeah, so long, kid. So long, Joe. Hey, watch your step. Joe, hold on. <laughs> You weren't coming. I'm sorry I'm late, Margo. You know, there's nothing duller than a dedication ceremony. I was beginning to think I'd have to sit through it all alone. Why, that's a fine thing to say, Margo. But I'm about to introduce you to Robert Lewis, the architect who designed this coast building. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, do you think you'd like to meet Miss Lane after that remark, Bob? Oh, of course I would. <laughs> I even agree with his statement. How do you do, Miss Lane? Hello, Mr. Lewis. Say, this is a distinguished gathering. Look who's among those present. Our good police commissioner. Hello there, Weston. Oh, hello, Lamont. Well, hello. hello, Commissioner. Uh, do you know Bob Lewis? Yes, glad to see you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, it brings you here, Commissioner. Duty. Just duty. These things bore me stiff. You waste half a day listening to an old stuffed shirt like Jerome Mead. Take a lot of bows and watch him lay a cornerstone. Why, Commissioner, <laughs> is that a nice way to talk about one of our leading citizens? Leading citizen, my eye. Need is as crooked as a corkscrew. Uh, if he didn't hold a high political office, the judge would have thrown the book at him years ago. Yeah. Furthermore, Ladies if we... Ladies and gentlemen... Oh. Here's your friend, Mr. Need, now. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to dedicate this glorious edifice. Although there were several unavoidable delays in the building's construction, we have still finished on schedule. And today I am justly proud to present to our fair city the world's largest and most modern structure. I would like at this time to... Get up of your lies, Mr. Need. What was that? Oh, what is Someone's this? cutting on the public address system. But there's no one standing beside him. you, Mr. Need. I shall continue your speech for you and tell the truth about this great building of yours. Where is that voice coming from? It is useless to attempt to find me. So you just have to listen. Right. Let's hear what he has to say, Margot. That's better. Many months ago, I warned Jerome Need not to try to erect a coast building. 
These warnings were not heeded. In reciting the glories of this building, Mr. Nee did not mention one very important thing that went into its construction. Human life. Yes, human life. The foundation of this building is not all steel, brick, and concrete. There is also blood. Blood of the men who died during its construction. That's a lie. That's a lie. Be quiet. I have another warning for you, Jerome Nee. And all of you listening shall be my witnesses. The ghosts of those men who died will return to haunt the coast building. In fact, before too long, the coast building will be known as the ghost building. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mr. Cranston. Is Mr. Lewis in, please? Oh, yes. Come come right in. He's expecting well, you. Thank you. Oh, Bob, Mr. Cranston is here. Righto. I'm Bob's uncle, John. Oh, how do you do, sir? Uh, this is Miss Lane. How, uh, how do you do, do Miss Lane? Lane? Well, Bob. Miss Lane. Hello. Uh, won't you come on into the study? Yeah, thank you. I'll have some tea prepared, Bob. Thank you, Uncle John. Uh, right in here, Lamont, Miss Lane. Thanks. Has anyone learned how that voice cut in on Mr. Need's speech yesterday, Bob? Yes. Uh, whoever it was hooked up another mic on the line inside the building. Oh, I see. But you haven't learned his identity? Uh, no. Uh, won't you sit down, please? Yes, Thank you. Thanks. Frankly, I'm worried, Lamont. I'm worried because the Coast Building has meant everything to me. I, uh... <laughs> I don't know if I've ever told you my earlier life, Lamont. Uh, no, you haven't, Bob. Well, I was brought up in an orphanage. Yes. Now, the only reason I tell you this is so that you might understand how important this job has been to me. You see, ever since I left the home, my one ambition was to find success as an architect. Which you certainly have. Well, I thought so until yesterday, but now I'm not so sure. Well, what do you mean, Bob? Well, if the coast building turns out as that voice predicted, if it is jinxed, then all my hopes are ruined. But surely you're not going to let an idle threat spoil this great triumph. I don't think it was an idle threat. Well, why do you say that? Well, let me show you this personal message that I discovered in this afternoon paper. I chanced on it in the classified section. Here you are, Lamont. Read this. Where is it? Uh, right there, right at the bottom of the page. Oh, yes, yes. To Henry Johnson, president of H.P. Johnson Corporation. This is not a warning. It is a forecast. The first of many to come. The ghosts of those who died that the coast building might be erected will return today to claim their own. Johnson has a suite of offices in that building. But surely a threat as public as that couldn't be carried out. Has anyone notified Johnson? I tried to reach him on the phone, but he was busy, so I left word for him to call me back. Well, perhaps we should go over there and... Oh, this may be he now. Hello. Oh, yes, Mr. Need. What? When? I see. I'll be right over. What's the trouble, Bob? Henry Johnson has just been found in his private office in the coast building. Stabbed to death. Gone down, 70th floor. Well, if I can crowd in here. Step in, sir. Move the rear of the car, please. We'll make room for you, Bill. Oh, hello, Fred. <laughs> Aren't you going home a little early? Well, to tell you the truth, Fred, I read that personal in the paper today, the one that forecast death to everyone using the express elevator at exactly 5 o'clock, so I, well, I figured I'd beat the rush. Superstitious? No, just careful. Well, it's a good thing that you're not superstitious because your watch is wrong. It's exactly 5 o'clock now. 5 o'clock. Listen, everybody. This car is out of control. Go home. This is the last window I'm going to wash, see? 55 stories is too high up. Ah, uh, stop grumbling, will you? Listen, did you see the paper this morning? There was an ad in it, see? And that ad says a window cleaner's going to do a Brody sometime today, and, brother, I just ain't going to be that guy. No, sir, I... Hey, hey my safety belt busted. Here, come here, hand. I, come here. I can't reach a car! Mr. 
Mr. Nade. I didn't ask you down to headquarters to get your opinion on what's legal and what isn't legal. That goes for you, too, Mr. Lewis. Commissioner, I'm not arguing with you at all. What? As both Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston here know, I'm just as anxious to solve this mystery as you are. That's true, Commissioner. All right, Cranston, just let me handle this. But I can't say that I think much of your handling so far, Weston. Oh, no, Mr. Need. Well, suppose you toy with this little statement for a few minutes. I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. What? Why, of all the... What do you base this on, Commissioner? Have you got any... Now, wait a minute, all of you. I've got a story to tell. It won't take long, but it definitely links you, Mr. Need... With these mysterious deaths. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but go ahead. Let's hear your accusation. I've been checking the newspapers to learn who was sending in those fatal ads in the personal column. And I learned that they'd been sent from various substations and paid for by postal money orders signed by different aliases. Why does that cast suspicion on me? Well, in the first place, Need, I've known you as a crook for many years. Why, you... But your fatal mistake was brought about by overconfidence. You see, the newspapers on orders from me did not publish the last warning they received. They turned it over to me. What are you driving at, Weston? This particular warning was addressed to Jules Seaborn, president of Seaborn and Eddie, one of the few remaining tenants in the building. It said that he'd be killed this afternoon. Have you warned Mr. Seaborn? Not personally. I left word for him to contact me. However, the warning wasn't necessary. Because I have the would-be murderer here in my office. Weston, I demand to know why you say that. Because, as I said before, overconfidence led to your fatal mistake. This last message to the papers was paid for by a money order signed by a person named Dean. D-E-E-N. Dean? Now, do you understand? Obviously, Dean is need, spelled backwards. Dean, eh? I'm beginning to understand. Ah. Tell me, Weston... Was there any first initial accompanying the name of Dean? As if you didn't know. Yes, my friend, the first initial was J. J for Jerome. I thought so. John Dean. What? He was the one who warned me not to put up the coast building. He said you will pay me back for what you owe me. Who are you talking about, Nate? Uh, I can't say just yet. Can't say? You're under arrest for murder and you can't say? Hello, Commissioner Weston speaking. Oh, hello, Commissioner. This is Jill Seaborn. You call me? Yes, Seaborn, I did. I thought you ought to know that I intercepted a newspaper ad today that forecast your being the next victim in the coast building. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. No one is going to kill me in the middle of the afternoon in the world's largest office building. Besides, my secretary is right outside the door, and she... <laughs> Who's that? What do you want here? Seaborn, what in blazes is that? Put down that gun. I said put down... Seaborn! Seaborn! I told you I was innocent, Commissioner. Well, Commissioner, who's your murderer now? More from the ghost building in just a moment. But first, are you looking for a home heating plan that will really give you your money's worth? Of course you are. And that's why I recommend Blue Coal, for Blue Coal is America's finest hard coal, and no doubt about it. You see, Blue Coal comes from the very heart of Pennsylvania's richest anthracite region, mined deep down in the earth, where only the best hard coal is found. Consequently, Blue Coal distributes a steady flow of even-burning, long-lasting, healthful heat from cellar to attic. Yes, a Blue Coal fire will keep you warm and comfortable, and help safeguard your family against colds, caused by chilly or underheated room. So fill your bin with blue coal. And when ordering, ask your dealer about the blue coal automatic heat regulator. It controls the heat in your home by automatically opening and closing furnace dampers. Yes, blue coal and a blue coal heat regulator working together make the modern combination for real comfort and real economy. This is part of the blue coal plan for better heat at less cost. Give your neighborhood dealer a call tomorrow. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the word Blue Coal. And now, we return to the Ghost Building. I realize that there's a slight penalty for illegal entry, Margot, but it must be done. Well, I'd like to know how you came by that bunch of skeleton keys, Lamont. Why, uh, in my spare time, I whittle them. In your spare time, you whittle them. That's right, I whittle them. 
Uh, there we are. Uh, may I have that flashlight, please? Yes, here you are. Thank you. Uh, you better stay close to me, Margot. With all these murders that have occurred here in the ghost building, it's just possible that what I seek in Mr. Lewis's office may be pretty well guarded. I won't stray. Don't worry. Well, let's have a look in this desk. May I hold the flashlight for you? Yes, please. Lamont, what if a watchman or someone should see this light? They only check this floor once an hour. I made sure of that. Well, no luck so far. What are you looking for? A very important bit of evidence that I hope to find here, but it doesn't seem to... Hello? What's this? Is that it? Is that what you were after, this letter? No, it isn't what I came after, but nonetheless, it just about cinches the case. Why? What's in it? I haven't even looked at its contents. The address in the envelope is all that I need. I'll show you what... What are you doing here? Steady, Margo. Answer me. Why are you here? If, uh... You take that mask off your face, I might answer you. You'll answer me now or I'll shoot. Now, look, we haven't any... Put out that flashlight, Margo. God, why, you... (laughs) No, no, it's no use, Margo. He's gotten away and we can't break through this panel. Lamont, where could he have gone? He's somewhere behind this wall. Did you see that trail of blood leading across the floor? Mm-hmm. I must have wounded him. Oh, what can we do? I know what you can do, Margot. What? Contact Commissioner Weston at once. Tell him to send a squad of men to the ghost building because I'm certain that another murder will soon occur. Well, where are you going? I'm going to pay a call on Robert Lewis's home. As the shadow. Uncle John? Uncle John, is that you? Hmm. Thought he came in. And now let me see. There's windows on the ground floor. Space for a store. (laughs) What was that? Sorry to interrupt your work, Mr. Lewis. Who is it? Who's speaking to me? I am known as the Shadow. Where are you? I, I don't see anyone. I'm standing right beside you, Mr. Lewis. But you needn't bother to look for me. By my hypnotic power, I've made myself quite invisible to your eyes. Why are you here? What do you want of me? I would like to know where your uncle is. Why, he's out. Then perhaps you can tell me what I wish to know about him. What is it? Is he really your uncle, Mr. Lewis? Of course. Of course he is. You're lying. Now, see here, I don't... The man that you call your uncle is in reality your father. Isn't this true? No. No. And you are not Robert Lewis... You are Robert Dean, the son of John Dean, the man you call your uncle. I don't know what you're talking about. Then perhaps if I remind you of a letter, it will help. A letter addressed to you at the orphanage, postmarked 1908. I found it in your office. How dare you rifle my office? I checked for the orphanage and found that a Robert Dean had been left there in 1908 at the age of three, after his mother had died and his father had been sent to prison to serve a 40-year term. He was sentenced for attempted murder on the person of Jerome Need, his business associate. You, uh, you learned all this? Your father was released in October of 1940 for good behavior. And he has since made good his revenge on Jerome Need. You can't prove that. Oh, but I can. By the money order that he signed with the name J.D. Jerome Need could identify him, too. Why do you do this to me? Because you share your father's guilt. Your complicity helped him perform the murder. No, no! You built those secret passageways in the building. And I have an idea that you even have blueprints. Secret blueprints of your work. Now, where are they? You'll never get those. So you have them then. In that drawer that you involuntarily reached Keep for. away from me. You shall never get those. Oh, prints. yes, I will. Don't put out that You're light. too late, Mr. Shadow. Not too late to see those prints and take Give them. Give them to me. Give them back to me. You'll never get them now. No, then you won't get me. Either. Lewis! I hated letting Lewis get away, but at least I have the blueprints, Margo. Here, take a look at them. What are those circles numbered, Mark? Well, number one was Johnson's office. Number two, the elevator shaft. 
Number three, the window ledge from which the cleaner fell. Number four, Seaborn's office. But what is number five? That's Circle Two. Uh, wait, uh, I'll look below. Oh, that's the conference room of the Board of Trustees. That must be the planned scene of the next murder. Oh, Lamont, do you really think so? Of course, Margot. If another vicious killing is to be averted, we must get to the ghost building at once. Come along, Margot. Weston's right down here. All right. Lamont, I wonder why the commissioner has stationed so many police on this conference room floor. Do you suppose something's happened? I don't know. I hope we're not too late. Oh, there's Weston. Commissioner! Wait a minute. Not so loud, Cranston. There's a meeting going on in there. I know. That's why I'm here. You've got to stop that meeting at once. Oh, is that so? Now, look, Weston. I happen to know that the next murder, all murders in this building, will take place in that room. Oh, you mean that ten board members all together, somebody's going to sneak in there and stab the ball. I'm <laughs> telling you the truth, Commissioner. And I'm telling you the truth. Need and his directors are holding a meeting in there. And at their request, they're not going to be disturbed. Now, that's my orders. And, Commissioner, you know how I love to break your orders. Hey, get away from that door. Oh, no. Mr. Cranston, I'm running this ship. Question. Put a handkerchief to your face at once. This room is full of a poisonous gas. Holy Moses. We must open the windows quickly. Are those men? Are they alive? There's a chance that they might be. How was it done? I was at the door. Don't talk, you fool. What? Uh, there we are. We've taken as much of this as we can stand. Come on. Yeah, I will. I was right there all of them. You all right, Weston? Uh, yes, I will. Get some men in there. Bring those directors out. Yeah, well, uh, Senator Hill. Come on, you boy. Come on. Come on. What happened? Our room is full of a poisonous gas. Oh it must have been released with the ventilating system. Are they, are they dead? I don't know. I hope not. I haven't time to wait to find out. Well, where are you going? The shadow is going to follow the secret passageway in the blueprint that will lead him to the murderers. Dad, won't you let me get you to a doctor? No. No, son. It wouldn't be safe for you. Besides, I'm afraid it's too late. This wound is bleeding so much. Dad, isn't there anything I can do? Yes. Yes, Robert, there is. What is it? My plan. My plan of vengeance. You must carry it through. Knowing that, I can die happy. That the, the shadow. I see you remember me, Mr. Lewis. How did you get here? Your blueprints were a great help. And now that I am here, your plan of killing is at an end. Who is this man? I cannot see him. I am invisible to your eyes, Mr. John Dean. But I'm familiar with all you've done. The victims you've claimed in this building. He knows everything? Yes, Dad, everything. Then he must know why. Why I killed. Need sent me to prison. I was an innocent man. An innocent man. My wife died of a broken heart when they took me away. That is why I swore vengeance against Mr. Mead. I've ruined him by destroying his greatest dream. Nonetheless, you and your son must both pay for your crime. No. No, not Robert. He mustn't suffer, too. He was your accomplice. Your willing accomplice. I see. Then you forced me to change my plans. Yes. What do you mean? I have a charge of dynamite planted down here for just such an emergency as this. I'm about to die anyway, and if my son is to face the electric chair, I'd rather he went out with me, taking all others with us. I wouldn't advise your doing that, Mr. Dean. You're too late, Mr. Shadow. My son has slipped over to the plunger that will set off the charge. See? Even now, he awaits my words. Yes. yes, how do you like that, Mr. Shadow? Don't touch that dynamite, Lewis. Go on, son. Now. The plunge of now. Yes. yes. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing happened. No. I should have told you that I discovered your dynamite and took the precaution of cutting the wire. I guess there's nothing left to do now, gentlemen, except to wait for the arrival of the police. So, before pronouncing sentence on you, John Dean, and your son, Robert Dean, I would like to point out to you and to all other members of society that no matter how great a grievance you have against an individual or individuals, you have neither a legal nor a moral right to seek a personal vengeance to atone that grievance. Your case is an object lesson of a familiar phrase that cannot be repeated too often. Crime does not 
pay. And now, before we hear from The Shadow again, a brief word from John Barclay, America's home heating expert. Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Gene Paul King, and good evening, friends. You know, of all the letters I've received recently, one from a man upstate interested me particularly. He wanted to know why his furnace fire kept dying out. Well, in the first place, a well-kept fire doesn't die out unless something's wrong with the draft. And a poor draft may be due to any number of causes, such as loose bricks in the chimney or blocked flue passages. So I advised him to get in touch with his neighborhood blue coal dealer immediately. Since then, he writes me that a John Barclay trained serviceman discovered the trouble was a leaking connection around the smoke pipe where it entered the chimney. Naturally, this caused him a great deal of unnecessary inconvenience until it was fixed. Well, I just thought I'd mention this as an example of a common complaint. And in case you're not entirely satisfied with the results your furnace is giving you, let a John Barclay trained serviceman give it the once-over. He can probably help you, too. For this extra customer service, just phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow morning. Thank you. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. the Blue Coal Dealers of America bring you an adventure of the shadow that will send thrills racing up and down your spine. So be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your friendly Blue Coal Dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. This is Jane Paul King saying, keep the home fires burning with Blue Coal. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r. Brought to you by G3PL.com. The Kraft Foods Company brings you The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Lois... I'm glad you called. You'll have to include me out tonight, Angel. I've sort of got a date with a blonde. What do I mean, sort of? Well, I'm not sure of her. You see, this gal likes to leave her man hanging. This is Ed Hurley, friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves. The case of the double exposure. Sunday afternoon and time for another thrilling adventure of the Falcon. But first, a word about another kind of adventure. An adventure in flavor. For right now at your grocer's, there's a wonderful new salad oil for use in your homemade salad dressings, your cooking, your baking. It's Kraft Salad Oil, the first salad oil ever offered for your home use by the makers of all those wonderful Kraft prepared dressings. Now, Kraft Salad Oil is more than just a new oil. 
It's a new kind of oil, a lighter-bodied oil to mix quickly and perfectly with all other ingredients. That's because it's not just refined. It's superfined by a special process created by Kraft. Yes, superfined to put new magic into the salad dressings you make yourself, into those wonderful chiffon cakes you pride yourself on, into every home recipe that calls for liquid shortening. Don't wait to get acquainted with Kraft Salad Oil. Look for the bottle with the beautiful label tomorrow at your grocer's. Get Kraft Salad Oil. And now, the case of the double exposure. It is early Sunday evening in New York, and a black chauffeur-driven sedan tears along one of the more deserted roads of the Bronx. In the back seat, a gentleman relaxes. His name is James Arcaro. Mr. Arcaro is a man who knows his way around, but at the moment he has begun to have his doubts. Say, Ralph, wasn't that Marshal of Parkway? I guess it was, Mr. Arcaro. Well, what are we doing here? I told you I wanted to go to Eileen Chambers' place. I must have misunderstood you. Wait a minute. You're not Ralph? No. Where is he? Let's just say he was indisposed, so he sent me in his place. Stop the car. Anything you say, Mr. Arcaro. What do you think you're doing? I'm going to open the door for you. What for? I'm not getting out. I got 500 bucks and a gun that says you're wrong. What's the idea? Ah, uh, you know. You're just trying to make conversation. All right, Arcaro, out of the car. Okay. Uh, tell me something, pal. Sure, but stay where you are and keep your hands at your side. Can I smoke? Yeah, but never mind reaching in your coat pocket. You can have one of mine. Here. You spare a light? Why not? Happy now? Yeah. I just wanted to get a look at you. I don't think it's going to do you much good, Mr. Arcaro. You never can tell. Your name's Ford, ain't it? Well, I'm flattered. I didn't think a big shot like you would know a peasant like me. Who are you working for? None of your business. You're one of Marvin Draper's boys, aren't you? Who? Marvin Draper. Ah, oh, come on, Ford, admit it. What do you got to lose? You all through with that cigarette? Were you the boy who took care of my partner, too? I don't know what you're talking about. Eddie Hutton. They tell me six months ago he took a dive in the Hudson River, forgot to come up. Now, how could that happen? Maybe because he was wearing a cement bathing suit. I wouldn't know, Mr. Arcaro. That's out of my line. Now, let's get this over with. Okay, Ford. But, but I'd like to ask you one other favor. What? Well, uh, maybe you hear I, I'm kind of proud of this face. I, I wouldn't like you to mess it up. Uh, how about uh, giving it to me in the back of the head, huh? Oh, that's a reasonable request. I don't see why I can't accommodate you. Turn around. You ready? Wait a minute, Ford. Uh, can you uh, work a little closer? Why not? How's this? I, I can't see. I'm practically on top of you now. That's all I wanted to know. Let go, I said let go. <laughs> go be nice to people. Who's there? Open up, Ford. It's the police. Oh, sure. Just a second. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Corbett. Darned if it ain't. It's on your mind, Sergeant. Where were you at 9 o'clock tonight? Right here. Now, that's interesting. Why do you suppose Jimmy Arcaro told us you were with him? What? You're a pretty careless fella. Next time you leave a man for dead, you better take a saliva test. What are you talking about? He was found by a prowl car 20 minutes after you left. You're lying. I pumped... Go on, Ford. What were you going to say? You pumped two slugs in him? Sure. But he didn't die instantly. He was obliging enough to stick around for that prowl car and give him your name before he kicked off. Who are you trying to kid? Don't believe me, huh? And how would I know that our Arcaro put up a battle before you killed him? You're crazy. And you're careless. You should wear overalls when you're working. What's that spot doing on your pants? Huh? Where? Right near the cuff. Don't tell me it's lipstick. Come on, get wise to yourself, Ford. You're through. Your only chance is to play ball with us. No. I'm telling you, yes. Did Marv Draper put you up to this? Come on, Ford. Don't be a patsy. 
Why should Draper get away while you burn? Draper had nothing to do with it. And who hired you? I don't know. You don't know. So help me, Sergeant. It's the truth. When I got home last night, there was an envelope under my door with five bills in it and a note. What kind of a note? Said if I knocked off her care, it'd be another five hundred tonight. Was there? No. Where's the original note? I tore it up. You're lying. Why should I? Listen, you punk. I want the truth. Who hired you to kill Jimmy or Carol? I tell you, I don't know. Well, until I find out, I'm going to make it so hot for you that when you sit in that seat at Sing Sing, you'll think you're squatting on an icebox. Now, let's go. Yes? I'm looking for Mike Waring. Who? Well, you know, the one they call the Falcon. What's your name, Angel? Eileen Chambers. Uh, are you wearing? Yes, I'm afraid so. Come in. Uh, take off your coat. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Pardon? I was just thinking out loud. You wouldn't care for a drink? No. You sure? Positive. You sound like a girl who knows her own mind. I do. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Well, what can I do for you, Eileen? Eileen? Uh, an efficiency expert once told me that by calling women by their first name, during a year I might save as much as... Uh... Three seconds. Well, well, there's no telling. He thought it might be as much as five. <laughs> What's in your mind, Eileen? Uh, take a look at this. Certified copy of last will and testament of James Arcaro. Where'd you get this? From Mr. Arcaro's attorney. You benefit under the will? Read the last paragraph. Everything else I own, I leave to my good friend and partner, Eddie Hutton. However, in the event of Eddie Hutton's death before mine, then I desire my estate to go to my protege, Eileen Chambers. Ooh, not bad. You like it? I'm crazy about it. How much did a carol leave? What's your guess? Ooh, around a million. It's closer to two. Well, that's really worth shooting for, isn't it? Just what is that supposed to mean? Oh, when Joey Ford bumped Arcaro, he really did you a favor. I don't like that kind of talk, Mr. Waring. Mr. Arcaro was a very dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Were you related? No, we had no family. He was interested in my voice. Oh, I see. He thought I had the making of a great singer. Well, just goes to prove you can't judge by appearances. Now, I never would have taken Jimmy for a patron of the arts, but... Uh... Oh, well, that's beside the point. How do I come into this? Well, when I spoke to Arcaro's lawyer this morning, he showed a very strange reluctance to pay off. And you can't blame him, Eileen. Who can't? I think he's got something up his sleeve, and I want to find out what it is. Seems pretty obvious. Ford hasn't told the cops who he was working for. It was Marvin Draper. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, suppose it was you. What? Well, let's face it, Angel. Arcaro's lawyer must have thought of that possibility, and so will the police. Under Arcaro's will, you come into quite a bundle. Well, that was just an accident. Eddie Hutton would have gotten it all if he hadn't died before Jimmy. Mm -hmm, but he did, Eileen. And we mustn't forget it. According to the grapevine, Eddie Hutton died in October, about two months after this will was drawn. So you see where that places you. But that's just a temporary delay, isn't it? Once Ford confesses who hired him to kill Arcaro, I should have no trouble. None at all, Eileen. Unless, of course, he names you. Say, mister. Mister? Who, me? Yeah. Did you happen to have a match with you? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Thanks. It's all right. Keep the whole pack. But if you want to keep your health, you'll behave yourself. What is this? Just walk around the corner. I got a car waiting. Why bother? I can get a cab. Don't be cute. You've read enough books to know why I'm keeping this hand in my pocket. Oh, yes. Forgive the oversight. I'll start walking. Look, friend, I don't want to be difficult, but you've got the wrong boy. You're Mike Ware in the Falcon, aren't you? Yeah. Well, then don't worry about any mistakes. My brother wants to talk to you. Your brother? Yeah. He's waiting for you in the car. Here he is, Eddie. Nice going, Alex. Get in, Waring. Yeah, sure, be glad to. All right, Alex, let's go. Right. Any place in particular you want Alex to drop you, Waring? Yeah, police headquarters would be fine. Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of our way. All right, now, look, what's this all about? Don't tell me you don't recognize me. No, I can't say I do. Ah, such is fame. 
To think only six months ago, my picture was all over the front pages. Hey, wait a second. Yes? You're Jimmy O'Carroll's partner, Eddie Hutton. You hear that, Alex? Yeah. Give the man a cigar. But I thought... I was at the bottom of the Hudson River. <laughs> you can't believe anything you read these days, can you? I heard Marvin Draper took care of you. Well, he was thinking of it, so I thought I'd better disappear. Uh, what made you come back? I got a wire from Alex this morning telling me that our care was dead and you were working for Eileen Chambers. My, my, how news travels. Uh, if you got a fee out of her, you ought to return it. Why? Because you can't earn it. Under the terms of Jimmy's will, all his money goes to me. Uh, Miss Chambers won't get a dime now. So, um... She'd better start saving her money. Miracle Whip has a flavor so pleasing. Miracle Whip tastes so lively, so teasing. Miracle Whip only one of its kind. Miracle Whip the best salad dressing you'll find. Miracle Whip is the only one of its kind. Because it's different, a different type of salad dressing made from a secret craft recipe. Miracle Whip combines the best qualities of boiled dressing and old-fashioned mayonnaise. So it's truly distinctive and delicious with a flavor millions of folks call just exactly right. Try it, won't you? One taste will tell you why it's America's favorite salad dressing. The one and only Miracle Whip. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. An hour has passed since Mike had his little interview with Eddie and Alex Hutton. And now, as we find him, he is relaying the information to his clients. Four, one, seven, seven. <clears throat> yes? Hello, is that you, Eileen? Mike Waring. Well, this is a surprise. I didn't think I'd hear from you for quite a while. Well, I told you I was a fast worker. <clears throat> I've got bad news for you, Angel. Bad news? As you know, that two million bucks you were counting on? Well, don't. I don't understand you. Eddie Hutton is alive. <laughs> oh, so you're a comic, too. I'm not kidding. I saw him not more than an hour ago. All right, I give up. What's the gag? No gag. Don't talk like a fool, Mike. Eddie Hutton's at the bottom of the Hudson River. Oh, not by a long shot. I'm sorry, Eileen. Still, it was awfully nice knowing you. Uh, maybe we can get together on something else. Hmm? Listen, Waring, you won't get away with this double cross. Now, you're wrong, Angel. I don't believe in threats. Oh, but but it... Before you make one, uh, hold the phone, huh? There's someone at my door. <laughs> Speak of the devil. I want to talk to you, Waring. There's no point in playing a repeat engagement, Hutton. I've already convinced you're alive. I was just telling Eileen. Is... is she here? No, I'm talking to her on the phone. Well, tell her. Tell her... Hey, what's the matter with you? Uh... Hutton. Hutton! Hello, Eileen, you still there? Yes, I'm not through with you. No, I'll say you're not. Forget what I told you about Eddie Hutton. But you said he wasn't dead. That was 20 seconds ago. Now he's gone and done it. Yeah? Marvin Draper. That's right. Who are you? Mike Waring. Well, come in. Thank you. Well, this is a pleasure, Mr. Waring. I've heard a great deal about you. I've heard a lot about you, Draper. Well, believe me, sir, I've done nothing to deserve it. Mm -hmm. You're just a little boy from down south came up to see the big city, huh? You're mocking me, Mr. Waring. You don't like that? No. So, if that's all you came here for... Uh, not quite. I... I thought we could talk a little business. I'm a private detective. Well, then you're wasting your time. I don't need one. You never know. Now, don't tell me that fellow who killed Arcaro confessed he was hired by me. No, but remember a man named Eddie Hutton? Mm, vaguely. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if the police want to talk to you about his murder. Well, they're a little late, aren't they? Yeah, well, they couldn't help themselves. His body just turned up an hour ago. Where? At my place. That's very amusing. I don't think so. You mean you can't see the comic possibilities in a man returning from the bottom of the Hudson? 
He wasn't at the bottom. He was in hiding. Oh, well, then the police did me a great injustice when they queried me about his disappearance. You think I ought to sue them for the embarrassment they caused me? No, I'd wait, Draper, because they're bound to cause you a lot more. They couldn't prosecute you then because they had no corpus delicti. What do you think they'll say when I tell them there's one in my apartment? Well, I'm not a gambling man, sir. But um, I wouldn't mind risking a few bob wagering. I know what they'll tell you. Yeah, what? That you're crazy, Mr. Waring. <laughs> now, you just see if they don't. You must be out of your mind to think I'd swallow a yarn like that. I tell you, Sergeant, Eddie Hutton's body is in my apartment. How about Judge Crater? He there, too? All right, all right. Be smart. But when your boys get back... What boys? Well, didn't you send a detail to my place after I called you? Are you kidding? Listen, Corbett, I'm not clowning. No, I don't think you are. What's your angle, Mike? Angle? You must have one. You working for Draper? Would I come here if I were? I represent a girl named Eileen Chambers. Oh, she... Well, Jimmy and Carroll left us some dough in his will. Is that so? Oh, now look, Corbett, she didn't kill him. You said she collected under his will. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Has Ford talked yet? No. Now I'm beginning to think that story of his about the 500 bucks in the envelope is true. But you do believe Draper was behind that? Yeah. Okay, then this is your one chance to nail him. How? Through the murder of Eddie Hutton. You're going to start that again? Listen, Sergeant... Suppose Hutton was seen around town today. So? So this was a perfect spot for Draper to act. Somehow he poisoned him. Poison? Well, that's the only thing I could figure out. There wasn't a mark on the body. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. A man sits down with a guy he knows wants to kill him and lets himself be poisoned, just like that. All right, all right. Maybe he wasn't poisoned. I'm no doctor. Draper could have killed him a hundred different ways. Look, why don't we go over to my place and you can see for yourself. Okay, Mike, I'll go along with the gag. All I ask is one thing. I got no sense of humor, so be sure and tell me when to laugh. Oh. What's the matter, Mike? Having trouble? No, I got it now. Uh, wait till I turn on the lights, huh? Where's Hutton? You blind? He's right there, but... Hey, he's gone. Is this where I start to giggle? I give you my word, Sergeant. He was right on the floor there. Very funny. I haven't laughed so hard. Oh, don't be a sap. You think I'd bring you up here on a wild goose chase? No, that's what bothers me. What do you mean? You're not the kind of a boy who goes in for practical jokes. You must have had a reason for this, and when I find out what it is... Wait a minute. What for? Did you bring that copy of Eddie Hutton's fingerprints with you? Yeah. But when Hutton keeled over, his hand hit the top of my desk. So what? So he wasn't wearing gloves at the time. Where's your fingerprint kit? Get me a glass of water. You need water to run the test? No, I'm thirsty. Oh, you... Well, hurry it up, will you? How you doing? Be throw in a second. But if you don't find a copy of Hutton's prints on that desk, I'll eat it. Okay, Mike, start eating. This desk is absolutely clean. Hearty appetite, pal. This is Ed Hurley here again, friends. I do want to tell you something I'm sure you mothers especially will want to know. It's how to get the finest cheese food you can buy for your family. It's simple, really. Just be sure you buy Velveeta. Kraft's delicious pasteurized processed cheese food. Velveeta tastes good, and it's so good for you, too. For Velveeta is rich in important food values from milk, and it's as digestible as milk itself. So it's perfect any time for snacks, sandwiches, and grand hot dishes. Try it, won't you, Mother? Make Velveeta your handy helper. Just be sure you get genuine Velveeta. The pasteurized processed cheese food of top quality, made by Kraft. And now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. A short while ago, Mike was dumbfounded when, after promising Sergeant Corbett the body of Eddie Hutton, he discovered he couldn't deliver, for the body was gone without a trace. 
And understandably enough, the good sergeant sees very little humor in the situation. Now, let me tell you something, Mike. You're not going to get away with this. If you think you can pull a stunt like this and make me the stool. Oh, you're out of your mind, sergeant. Oh, that's good. That's good, coming from you. I tell you, Eddie Hutton's body was here. Draper must have removed it. You would send a squad when I called Don't you. give me that. Now oh, you're talking like a child. Why would I dream up a story like that about Hutton? I told you how his brother Alex hijacked me this afternoon. Well, for your information, Alex Hutton is in Florida. He's what? Yeah, he was picked up there a couple of days ago for making book. Before they let him go, they wired us if we wanted him for anything. So, if you've got anything else to say... Shut up. Who do you think you're talking to? I'm sorry, Corbett. I didn't mean it that way. You see what I see? Where? On the carpet, under the sofa. That pocket comb? Yes, that's not mine. Someone must have kicked it there. Where's your fingerprint outfit? Listen, Mike. Well, what have you got to lose? All right. Now, don't touch it. You got enough powder? Yeah. Well? Can't you be quiet for a minute? Well, what do you know? There's a right thumb and forefinger on here. Look at this copy. They both belong to Eddie Hutton. Well, what did I tell you? I take it all back. Where's your telephone? Come in. Hello, Waring. Oh, so he was in Florida, huh? Say, what goes on here? You're just the boy I want to see, Alex. Sergeant, meet Alex Hutton. Is he the one? Yeah, he's the one. I want to talk to you, Alex. Well, that makes us even, because I want to talk to you. Where's my brother? Eddie? Who did you think I meant? He's not here. I can see that for myself, but where is he? He left my place two hours ago and said he was coming here. Well? Well, he hasn't been back since. Well, it's easy to understand, Alex. He's dead. I don't like those kind of jokes, Waring. It's the truth, Alex. I'm asking you for the last time. Where's my brother? I told you he's dead. You just won't be serious, will you? I... All right, you better put away the rod, Alex. This man's a sergeant with the New York police. Yeah, and I got a badge, too. I like... asked you a question, Waring. And I answered it to the best of my ability. Eddie's dead, and you better reconcile yourself to it. Who killed him? I don't know. Maybe Marvin Draper. Yeah. Or maybe it was your client, Eileen Chambers. Why should she? I suppose you forgot all about Jimmy Arcaro's will. Now, with Eddie out of the way, she's going to be sitting pretty. Yeah, you've got a point there. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, friend. Eileen isn't going to live to spend a dime of that money. You better watch your step, Alex. They can burn you for this. Shall I tell you something, Waring? If I can get Eileen, it'll be worth it. I'll be seeing your friends. <laughs> If it isn't Alex Hutton. You surprised, Eileen? Not particularly. Come in. Let me have your coat. No, no thanks, baby. I don't think I'll be staying very long. That's where you're wrong, Alex. Uh, what's the idea of the gun? I'm just beating you to the draw. Are you crazy? Well, wasn't that what you came here for? Of course not. Well, then why do you suppose Mike Waring made up the story? Mike Waring? That's right. You talked to him? Uh-huh. How? For a smart boy, Alex, you made an awful boner. Didn't you ever hear of the telephone? Great invention. He didn't call Oh, you. yes, he did. He should be here any minute. Oh, there, that's probably him now. Uh, come in. Hi, Eileen. Hello, Mike. Who is your friend? Huh? Oh, that's right. You haven't met, have you? Eileen, this is Sergeant Corbett. Glad to know you, Miss Chambers. Thanks. Isn't she a great gal, Sergeant? Look how she's in command of the situation. Just like the Marines in Korea. Aren't you proud of me? Oh, Angel, what a question. You're all in this together. You better be careful with those accusations, Alex. Let me have the cannon, Eileen. What for? Well, that's an awfully big gun for a little girl like you to carry. Oh, I don't mind. Don't think I'm swallowing this routine, because I'm not. You're all partners. Where's our motive? Two million bucks that Jimmy Arcaro left my brother. Sure. You hired Ford to kill Jimmy, and then one of you poisoned Eddie. You're wrong, Alex. Yeah, but then where is he? Where he's been for the past six months at the bottom of the Hudson. What are you babbling about? That guy who died over at my place was a plant you dug up for the occasion. Are you nuts, Mike? Next you'll be saying he hired Ford to kill Jimmy Arcaro, too. Why, Sergeant, how did you guess? You took the words right out of my mouth. Admit it, Eileen. Isn't this cozy? I still don't see why we couldn't have brought your friend along. My friend? Mm-hmm. Sergeant Corbett. I think he's cute. Oh, really, Eileen? You disappoint me. 
Why, if I told you some of the things I know about Corbett... I'd much rather you told me about Alex Hutton. Oh, believe me, he's a much nicer guy. Even though he did hire Ford to kill Jimmy Acaro. Why? Well, so that Acaro's will would go into effect. You see, under its terms, if Eddie Hutton was alive at the time, he'd come into everything. That's why Alex showed up with his brother's double. Well, why did he kill him later? Well, the man had performed his purpose. All Alex wanted to establish was that his brother lived longer than Acaro. In that way, your interest would be wiped out and everything would then go to Eddie Hutton. Well, how did that affect Alex? Well, if Eddie Hutton survived Acaro, the money would go to Eddie's next of kin. Not to me? No. So, naturally, Alex tried to convince us that his brother had lived longer than Acaro. Once he had me convinced, he removed the body. Why? Well, he couldn't afford to let it be found again because then it would be easy to prove the man was a phony. But with my story that I had talked to Eddie Hutton today, plus the fingerprints on the pocket comb he planted in my apartment, Alex had all he needed to substantiate his case. Well, what was his mistake? Oh, well, he made several. For one thing, he knew that the man who died in my place was a victim of poisoning. Well, how could he know that when he'd never seen the body? Then his hokey threat about killing you was a boner, too. Don't you think he meant it? No, of course not. He did that for effect. He wanted to show us he was all broken up over his brother's death and that he felt you were responsible. <laughs> you don't really believe he forgot we could telephone ahead and warn you. He wanted us to stop him. Now, Alex wasn't taking any chances of getting in trouble with two million bucks inside. Which now belongs to me? Which now belongs to you. Now, does that take care of all your questions? All but one. Just ask it, Angel. What time is it? Uh, Ten o'clock. Why? I don't want to be late for my appointment with uh, Sergeant Corbett. Oh, 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 you don't mean that. Uh-huh. He's waiting for me at the Belvedere. Well, what's he got that I haven't got? Me? And two million dollars. Good night, Mike. America's defense program has placed on the Red Cross one of the greatest responsibilities it has ever had to assume. Now, in addition to day-to-day -day aid to the sick and injured, the Red Cross must extend its services to the men of our growing armed forces in camps and hospitals, at home and overseas. Now, too, the Red Cross must recruit, train, and equip millions of home defense volunteers in first aid and home nursing. And the Red Cross system of blood banks must be expanded to meet greater civilian and military needs. That's why Red Cross needs your help. By giving as generously as you can to the Red Cross, you are helping to mobilize for the defense of your family, your community, your country. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Until now, this story has been top secret. Top Secret, the exciting NBC presentation starring gorgeous Ilona Massey as the Baroness Karen Gazer in transcribed dramas of international intrigue and espionage before and during World War II. Assignment 4, Escape, a story until now, Top Secret. As an Allied agent in a Europe at war, my job is to fight Nazism and fascism in any and every way I can. In Hitler's Berlin, this is a dangerous job. I have been many things. A singer, a nurse, a stenographer, a manicurist. Right now, I'm the private maid, really the confidential companion of Emmy Goering, wife of the air marshal himself. Assignment 4 began a week ago, last Thursday. I was spending my afternoon off in the tear garden, sitting on a bench and throwing crusts of bread to the fat, pompous pigeons. Come on. Well, are you hungry or aren't you? Are you? Then here. Oh, 
Don't be so greedy. I have a whole bag full of crust. Come on, come on. Here is another. Chippy, 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 chippy. <coughs> oh, you scared them. I'm sorry. Well, don't look so sad about it. There isn't exactly a shortage in pigeons. Look at that one. A big fat cross and you can't see it. Fraulein. Yes? Would you mind if... Would I mind what? Oh, would you like to feed them? May I? Well, of course. I have a whole bag full of crust. Help yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no, not a whole handful. Just a crust at a time. If you give them too much, they will... Oh, no. I feel that hungry. Wait, please, don't go. And don't be embarrassed. Being hungry is not a crime. May I, may I finish some? Why didn't you say you were hungry? <coughs> and you are sick too, aren't you? You are, I can see you are sick. You shouldn't be talking to me. I'll go now. Have you no money? No. Please let me help you. Uh, no, I can't. I'll go now. Were you bombed out? Yes. Yes, bombed out. And now you have no place to go? That's right. Then please come home with me. No. That's very kind of you, but I'd rather not. Don't be proud. There are many like you. Come home with me and I have something to give you to eat. I have a small apartment around the corner. Please come. Why are you doing this? Must there be a motive to everything? I will ask nothing of you but that I be allowed to feed you. And you will ask nothing of me at all. Mm, that was wonderful. I don't know how to thank you. Then don't try. Don't even talk. How long since you have slept? Oh, I don't know. Two days, three days. I'm afraid I've lost track of time. Would you like to sleep here? No, I can't. Why are you afraid of me? No, I'm not. You are. I can see it in your eyes. Uh, look, my friend. I don't know who you are. I don't care. I do not use this apartment. You may stay here as long as you wish, or you may leave now. It's up to you. Well, if... I'm so tired. Could I stretch out on your couch for an hour? Of course you may. If you can sleep after that enormous meal, you must be very tired. Well, I was a bit of a pig, must I? <sighs> I'm afraid the couch is too short. Oh, no. It's wonderful. Wonderful. <sighs> No. Well, he was a poor answer. If I have a man, Tom. If I have a man. 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 You are all right. I have a man. I have a man. I have a man. You are all right. You are safe now. How long have I slept? About five hours. It is night. Did I... Did I say anything in my sleep? Oh, don't worry. I have to go. I must get out of here. If I were you, I would stay right where you are, Philip. What do you mean? I know who you are. You were clawing at your collar, your shirt opened. I saw your identification discs. You are Flight Lieutenant Philip George Cornelius, RAF. The door is locked. Look here, I... I don't want to hurt you. But if you don't give me that key, I'll have to take it. But of course I'll give it to you. Here. Take it. I... I just don't understand you. The door was locked to keep people out, not to keep you in. Now, will you sit down and listen to me? Go ahead. I'm an allied agent. I'm on the same side as you are. But your accent, how... how I was once the Baroness Karen Gaze of Vienna. Believe me, I hate the Germans as much as you do. Sleep here tonight. And keep away from the windows and don't answer the door. I will come back tomorrow and at noon. I think I can find a way to get you out of Berlin. How? Through my employer. Someone important? 
The wife of someone important. Who? Emmy Goering. Emmy? Not the Emmy Goering. Yes. The Rice Marshal's wife? Mm-hmm. You were working as a spy inside the Goering house? Very successfully. What's she like? Well, sometimes she's kind. But sometimes she's a fiend. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed. Remember, don't answer the door and don't go to the windows. And don't worry. I know how to get things from women, too. Well, Karen, you asked for a week off. I've said you could have it. But now I want my hair set and a manicure. Then I want you to go to... What are you crying about? You are so good. So kind. No other woman in Berlin has your heart. I admire you so much. I believe in being fair. You're a good maid. You work hard. Now stop sniffling and start on my hair. Yes, Frau Gurig. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, are you in some sort of trouble? Well, are you? Answer me, Karen, when I ask a question. No, no. I'm not in trouble. A friend of mine is in trouble. Ah, a man. I knew it. I have not seen him for so long, Frau Göring. He's a flyer. He was wounded. Now he's better. In a week, he reports back to his base. So, what do you expect me to do? I said you could have a week off. I was... I was wondering if, if you could possibly... Well, say it, say it. Don't be timid. Oh, I suppose they wouldn't allow you to. You suppose what? I suppose they wouldn't allow you to loan me a car for a week. Allow me? Yes. Uh, Fritz at the motor pool said that, well... <laughs> He hinted that you couldn't. Oh, he did, did he? If you want a car, you may have it. My little Opel, with gas. I'll type a note to Fritz and I will sign it. Allow me, indeed. Philip. Philip, it's me. I thought you'd never come. I brought you a suit, a razor, some underwear, and a shirt. And best of all, I've got a car, a car for a whole week. A car where? Frau Göring loaned me her Opel, with a tank full of gas and extra tickets. I've got to go to the motor pool and get it. I'll be back in an hour. In the meantime, you can clean up. Where did you get the money for all this? Never mind. Be dressed and ready to leave when I get back. Karen. Yes. While you were out, the paper came. You didn't go to the door. I told no, you No, I that. heard the girl deliver it, and I took it in after she'd left. What's the matter? The second column, there. Read it. In consequence of increasing air raids upon German cities, the high command has made the decision that all enemy Air Force personnel who land on German territory will henceforth not be taken prisoner, but will be shot on sight. If you're with me, they'll shoot you too, helping a prisoner to escape. You can't do it. I can manage somehow. It's inhuman. Inhuman. It's Germany. We'll just have to risk it. No, I'll risk it, not you. It will be my way or not at all. I'll go for the car. Be ready to leave when I get back. <laughs> I can't get over you. Tell me about yourself. Oh, not much to tell. Born in a little town called Brockenhurst, not far from Southampton. Took Lord Oxford, then came the war and I enlisted. <laughs> How brief a story can one tell? <laughs> Talking about it makes me homesick. <laughs> I say, what's that? Their flashlights are hit. Lean back and keep quiet. No, run them down. Run them down. I just keep quiet. There is a better way. Please do as I say, and for goodness sake, don't open your mouth. That accent would give you a in a second. I've heard some bad German in my days, but nothing like yours. All right, Fräulein, pass the curfew hour. There's no private traffic out of Berlin tonight. Have you looked at the license plate, Sergeant? I'm not interested, Fräulein. Turn back. Perhaps you will be interested in the crest on the bonnet. Go ahead. Use your flashlight. Right, Marshals. Forgive me, Fräulein. I did not notice. 
I presume you have permission? Your caution is praiseworthy, Sergeant. Just don't go too far. Here is an order signed by Frau Göring herself. Thank you, Fräulein. I will raise the barrier. Proceed, Fräulein. Have a good journey. I hit now. <laughs> you see how easy it is when one knows the right people? Now we are out of Berlin. You're wonderful. You didn't turn a hair, and I thought I'd shake right out of my clothes. A man with courage is a man who controls his fear. If you were afraid, you didn't show it. Now where? You'll find a map in the glove compartment. Get out. Get it out, please. All right, huh? Find the central autobahn, the main highway. It's a heavy green line. Which direction? South. South? We'll never get to England going south. And which way would you suggest? Why, west, of course. Yes? Yeah? Through the entire German army, through occupied France, through the Channel Coast fortifications, then swim across the Channel. Is that your idea of best way? <laughs> I'm overruled. What's your plan? A diagonal across Germany. Follow me on the map. Berlin to Leipzig. Right. Leipzig to Plauen. Plauen to Nuremberg. Nuremberg to Ulm. Then we go across... Hold it, hold it, hold it. Ulm. Right. Then? Across to Friedrichshaven, on the Bodensee. Then to Lake Constance. And there, I'll drop you off. You can get the fishing boat across to Switzerland. Switzerland? But I'd be holed up there for the rest of the war. And what's wrong with that? There are other names on this map, Karen. Belsen, Buchenwald, Dachau, Auschwitz. Rotten, horrible names like swords. I can't sit it out in Switzerland. What are you stopping for? Karen, why are you stopping? Because I want to think. Can't you get me back to England? I am in this kind of work for one reason, the same reason you are, to fight. But Philip, we are surrounded. Denmark occupied, Holland occupied, Belgium occupied, France occupied. There is no other way but Switzerland. Please take me to Holland, please. I'll risk it for the Dutch. They'll pass me through the underground and I can get to the North Sea. Thousands of our boys have come back that way. I know that I'll be able... I've no right to endanger you. It's your decision. We'll go wherever you say. We drove across Germany, from Brandenburg to Bielefeld. The Göring crest and the bonnet of the car opened every barrier. We drove by night, traveling the back roads in the daytime we slept. Wherever we could find a hidden place, on the bridges, in forests, in haystacks. Karen, wake up. <laughs> What time is it? It's dark enough to start. It's 8.30. I never knew a haystack would feel so wonderful. Most of it's in your head at the moment. From where we are, it's hard to imagine there is a war at all. Look at the sunset that's mm. left of it. Pinks and the reds. If only the whole world could be like this. Someday, perhaps. I wonder. Oh, I believe in miracles now after having met you. We're halfway there. Münster is more than halfway. How far are we from the town itself? Oh, about a mile. But we won't go through it. We'll go around it. Then west to Coesfield, to Wessel. If we are lucky, we can reach uh, Wessel. In... Karen, listen. Where are they? There. Over there. Hundreds of them. Look, Karen, those are the Lancasters. The Stirlings. They are going to bomb Münster. It's a saturation raid. We'll have to go back. No, we're safer here in the open country. We are only a mile from the center of the town. Please, Philip, let's turn back. Karen, you can't raise a Lancaster in a German car. We'll have to sit it out. Look, Karen, Canadians. Go ahead, boys. Give it to them. Give it to them. Blast them right off the earth. Philip! Philip! 
Philip, speak to me. Philip, you can't die. I won't let you die. It's no use, Karen. No. Don't say that. Don't. You are going home. You are going home to England. Please, Philip, don't give up. Please. <laughs> Leave me, Karen. Don't be a fool. Leave me. Try to stand up. Please, Philip. <laughs> no. It's no use. Stop that. Stop it. We'll get you to a doctor. Somehow we'll get you to the doctor. Just, just a few steps more. <laughs> don't faint. Please don't faint again. Don't be afraid. I've got my gun. Don't be afraid. Come to your Doctor, help us. My brother was hurt on the road to Münster. Yeah, yeah, come in. Shrapnel in the shoulder. On the couch, please, Fräulein. That's it. Easy, easy. Lean on me. That's it there. We were caught in the raid on Münster. He's lost so much blood. Do not worry, Fräulein. You will expose the shoulder, please. I have no nurse. Yes, Doctor. I will not be a moment. You are safe now, Philip. You are safe. There is shirt, Fräulein. Well back. Yes, Doctor. Oh. So good. He has fainted. That is an angry shoulder. What are those? Identification tags. A-R-F? You mean he's English? Yes. Those are English dog tags. Uh, Fräulein. And this is a German pistol. You will remove the shrapnel. Nein. I've heard that doctors take an oath to help the sick heal the wound. I'm a German. I cannot. You're a doctor. You will. Well, doctor? Very well. Scalpel, please, Fräulein. <laughs> It is done. Are you all right, Philip? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. A doctor, we want food. At the point of a gun, Fräulein? Doctor, I am Viennese. I am different from your stolid German women. It would not cost me a thought to kill you. I've killed before. Now food, and quickly. I have some bread, some fresh milk. That is all. Get it. should have shot him, Karen. We will be across the border station in two hours. He will keep until then locked in his cellar. I have a feeling that something is... Lie back. Try to get some sleep. In another two hours, it will be all over. There's a bridge at Newmargen, and from there you can follow the Wall River to the sea. I'll wake you up at the border station. Controller, Neymagen, Colonel Dietz speaking. In my direction? What kind of a car? Hmm, Opel. Yeah, wounded man and the girl. Her brother. Oh, yeah, RIF. Doctor in Münster. Yeah, we will watch. I assure you they will not pass. Right. I'll be the heron. Sergeant! What is it, sir? A man and a woman in an opera headed this way from Münster. He is an English flyer, and they are posing as brother and sister. You know the law? They will be shot. Yeah, Herr Colonel. You will wait and see to it yourself. They will be here in an hour or two. Bring them to me instantly. The fort. At once. And remember, Sergeant, you are on detention tonight and tomorrow. Yeah, well, Herr Colonel. That's all. Watch for them. If there's any trouble, shoot on sight. Don't ask questions, don't argue, shoot. Now go. Philip, Philip, wake up. Mm. 
We are coming to the border station. This is the most dangerous barrier yet, and the last. We are brother and sister, and we lost our papers in the Münster raid. But the Göring crest and the car will work once more. What if they stop us? Shall we make a dash for it? They won't stop us. Nobody stopped us yet. And for heaven's sake, don't speak. Pretend you're asleep. Good evening, Fräulein. Your paper, please. We lost them in the raid on Münster. Turn off your motor. Certainly. Now, get out. Sergeant, my, my brother is badly hurt. Shrapnel in the shoulder. He has lost so much blood. Your brother? Yes, I said that. Get out of the car, Fräulein. And the man, too. If you will look at the bonnet of the car, you will notice I am that... not interested in the car. I am interested in you. Both of you. Get out. Now. We are looking for a wounded brother. Herr Colonel, the prisoner, sir. Bring them in, Sergeant. Marsh. I said Marsh! Anyone can strike a wounded man, Sergeant. When I say march, you march. Now go on. So, this is the wounded brother and his sister. How very interesting. And how very unconvincing. I would advise you to identify yourself, my young friend. Don't say anything, Philip. Fräulein, I will deal with you later. Now, Herr Leutnant, who are you? Come, come. We know you are a British flyer. You will be shot in any case. If you identify yourself, you will have a cross on your grave. If you don't, you will be buried in a pit of lime. You have three seconds in which to choose. I'm Lieutenant Philip George Cornelius, 2727 said Royal Air Force. I was shot down over Berlin two weeks ago. Thank you, Herr Leutnant. Sergeant! Colonel! You, Herr Leutnant, will wait. I'll take the girl upstairs. I will deal with her personally. All, Herr Colonel! You may go, Fräulein. Which way, Sergeant? Fräulein, wait. Did he say you had come all the way from Berlin? Yes, in four days. You have perhaps friends in the underground in Holland, yes? Why are you asking me this? Fräulein, I... Germany is sick. With America in the war, we cannot win. I have tried many times to get out. I, I was a baker. I made bread. These Nazis, there... There is such a thing as a German who is not a monster. What are you suggesting? Take me with you. You are not serious. I'm partly Jewish. The colonel knows. He, he makes me do things that I do. Simply by a telephone call, he can finish me. That is why I struck you, brother. I must pretend to be brutal. I, I'm not naturally an animal, Fräulein. You mean, you mean you will help us? It is only a hundred yards to the Dutch frontier. The underground will help a British flyer. If I get you out of this place, will you take me with you, yes? But the colonel... Will you take me with you? Of course we'll take you. Then I will deal with the colonel now. I've waited a long time for this. If you refuse to talk, Leitnant, what is it, Sergeant? Goodbye, Herr Colonel! <laughs> Come with me, please. No. We can get through Holland in the boat. Karen, I love you. There isn't much time to say it. I want you to marry me. You would not sit out the war in Switzerland. My job is back in Berlin. But you may not get back. This way is sure. Please. I'll get back. By the time they discover his body, I'll be at Minster. Don't talk anymore till it go. Then after. Will you come to me afterwards? Afterwards. Perhaps. If you want to. I want to very much. Please! All right. Hope for it, Karen. Pray for it. Pray for it, yes. Every day. Lightning! I love you. Coming! Goodbye, Philip. The little boat fled down the river into the darkness. He had gone. 
and something of me has gone with me. A week later, I was back in Berlin in the private air raid shelter of the House of Göring. Just Frau Göring and myself. You never told me, Karen. Your friend, that you enjoy the week together? Very much, Frau Göring. He has gone back to his base? Yes. But he will come back to Berlin. Well, I... Yes. Yes, he will come back to Berlin. In fact, I have the feeling he is very close right now. You have just heard Ilona Massey starring in NBC's Top Secret. Here she is again to tell you about next week. Next week, a woman in an armchair, a sable coat, and the forgery that fooled Berlin. The story of a cast and a broken leg, and a theft. It is a story that has been until now top secret. <laughs> Top Secret in part transcribed is produced by Harry W. Junkin. The script by Alan Sloan. Featured with Miss Massey was Lester Fletcher as Philip. Other players in the cast were Louis Van Ruten, Brian Rayburn, Carl Emery, and Earl Hammond. The music was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shields. Fred Collins speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You have been Lish Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.